Ms. Sandoval as well. Oh, okay, no worries. Dan, this is Joanne. Joanne, how are you? I'm good. Um, I just wanted to let you know that Shane has worked with me on my issue with my iPad, and we're not sure why. So if you call on me, I promise I'm continuing to try to respond to you. Um, but for some reason, you're not hearing me. Well, not a problem. We'll, um, we'll give you time, and if we need to circle back like we've had done, that's not a problem. Thank you. Hi, Ms. Sandoval, can you hear us? Hi, yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Looks like we have Mr. Ibarra on, Joanne. Hello, Mr. Ibarra, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Hello, everybody. Hi, Mr. Ibarra. Hello, Mr. Ibarra. Hey, how, how are you, Frank? Good, good. Hi, Mr. Ibarra. Hello. Hey, Joanne. Still waiting for Mrs. Hollow and Mr. Fuentes. Okay. Bertha, would you mind leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance uh, when we get going? Okay, thanks. Okay. Yes, I had to use my phone because the iPad's not working. But I'm here. Good evening. Uh, Mr. Uh, Fuente is having uh, some connectivity issues, but he's going to try to get on uh, on the phone. So yeah, I, ha I had to end up. Um, doing that as well. Oh, okay. Uh, I think we have quite a bit of people trying to log on, I think. Uh, so. Before we get started, uh, Dr. Miranda, I know we have a number of public comments that need to be read by her. By Ms. Medina, uh, there was a thought or a question about perhaps giving her a little bit of help with that. Was that something we were going to do or is Joanne going to power through? Uh, it, it, Oh, oh! Thank you. You'll, you'll. So you'll let me know when that trade off or that handoff will will take place. Oh, perfect! I made it. Oh, just like graduation. There you go. Thank you, Mr. Flores. I appreciate that. Yeah, no. uh, stressing out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Not a problem. No problem. Right. Mr. Fuentes, glad you were able to join us. Sorry about that. Yeah. Connectivity. Some issues with my Wi-Fi here locally, so I, I'm in. Okay. I think we have everybody on at this point. Uh, so, Mr. Flores, uh, it is yours. All right. Thank you for that, Dr. Miranda. Uh, well, good evening. We'll call to order this special board meeting for the Colton Joe Unified School District Board of Education, Wednesday, 20, uh, February 24th, 2021. Uh, we'll begin with a roll call, and then we'll go to Pledge of Allegiance. So I'll ask Ms. Medina to please call roll. Ms. Doreen Ojeda? Here. Ms. Bertha Adigi? Here. Mr. Dan Flores? Here. Mr. Israel Fuentes? Here. Ms. Bernice Sandoval? Here. Mr. Frankie Barra? Here. Mrs. Pat Hara? Here. Thank you. 
Thank you for that. All board members are present and accounted for. Uh, this time we'll uh, have our customary Pledge of Allegiance and I would like to ask our Vice President, Board Member Roberta Aragin, to please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Sure. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you for that, Mrs. Aregin. All right, this takes us to item 1.3 on the agenda, which is the adoption of the agenda. Uh, at this time, staff does not have any recommended uh, amendments uh, to the agenda. Is that correct, Dr. Miranda? That is correct, uh, uh, President Flores. Okay. Um, would it be appropriate then to, to um, make a motion to adopt the agenda as presented, or are we sufficiently good to keep on going through? There are no changes, so. Uh, if you'd like to take a motion and I believe that's the uh, it's customary. So let's do that. Since the, the agenda is presented and no amended changes at this time, but I'll ask for a motion to accept the agenda as presented by uh, by staff. Is there a motion? So moved. We've got a, a motion from board member Haro, and we'll call it a second by board member Karen Ojeda. Um, and I'll ask for roll call vote. Ms. Medina, please. Mr. Ibarra? Mr. Ibarra? Yes. Mrs. Haro? Yes. Mr. Flores? Yes. Ms. Doreen Ojeda? Yes. Ms. Bernice Sandoval? Yes. Mr. Fuentes? Yes. Ms. Arigui? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. So the agenda is approved as presented um, on a 7 0 vote unanimous. This takes us to public comment. Um, and so at this time, I will hand it over to Ms. Medina uh, to begin with the public comment. Just a reminder to those that are listening in and participating in the meeting, uh, public comment is limited to three minutes per speaker. Comments have been uh, submitted to the district office, the Board of Education. Uh, for those whose comments may go over that three minutes or may be cut off by because of the three minute rule, I uh, just want everyone to know we do have complete copies of all public comments that have been submitted. Those documents have been presented to the board as well as our cabinet and wherever possible and whenever possible and where appropriate, we respond to those. So just wanted again that um, uh, note for those that are listening, maybe their first time participating. Ms. Medina, please. Thank you. Public comment number one, Bernadette Pedroza, grant teacher. Good evening, school board members. My name is Bernadette Pedroza and I'm a veteran teacher with 22 years of teaching in this district and fortunately all of those years have been at the same school. I'm writing to you today to ask you to delay the reopening of in-person teaching in our schools. As a person who is in the trenches, here are some of my concerns. One, the ventilation systems. In our classrooms, we're not the best pre-COVID, let alone now in the pandemic. Two, we need sufficient teacher staff vaccinations, two doses prior to going back to in-person instruction. Three, our MNO team needs to establish set, a set cleaning and sanitation, sanitation plan as well as accountability. As a district, we have to have accountability that these rooms are cleaned and sanitized daily. Too often we are told that our rooms will just be trashed. In these COVID times, this is unacceptable. Four, Please keep in mind that schools have not been closed. Teachers have been delivering quality instruction daily. Our students have established routines and learning practices. If we go to in-person instruction this late in the year, we will have to allow for student assimilation into their new routines, which will be an extended loss of learning. Five, if the state proceeds with administering the CASP, our students will be dealing with the assimilation process as well as CASP testing. This will inadvertently cause more damage to their social emotional well-being. At this point in the year, it makes more sense to finish the year in distance learning and plan for our return in August. Board members, I trust you will make the best decision for our staff and students, as now more than ever, our lives and those of our families are in your hands. Thank you, Bernadette Pedroza, fourth grade teacher, Grant Elementary School.
Well, we have a copy of it since we uh, have quite a few we need to adhere to the three minute rule today. Thank you, though. We'll go to the next speaker. Thank you. Public comment number three Mark Howard, Bloomington High School teacher. Esteemed board members, as both a parent and a teacher in our district, I have to stand behind the best source best course of action for our students. We have seen depression and suicide rates in children rise throughout the nation during COVID, and we have also witnessed that inequities distance learning has exacerbated in our most at-risk populations. These trends are not unique to any particular geographic area and are happening within our own district. I have spoken to a number of students who are suffering from depression due to a lack of social interaction. Many of our students have had their grades increasingly slide as the year progresses due to the lack of structure and an abundance of distractions at home. But the students who have been affected most in the last year are our most vulnerable at risk students. Many of our high school students are left home with younger siblings who they are responsible for, leaving them with little time and ability to focus on their own studies. This is no fault of the parents. They have to work in order to provide for their families but the students are victims of this situation nevertheless. As a parent, I have seen this firsthand. I am not able to help my own children in more advanced classes and online tutoring does not take the place of in-person instruction. Other parts of our state and nation are opening schools and our students are falling behind. What chances will CJUSD students have in the future competing for spots in universities and for scholarships if our children are at home while the competition is in the classroom? As a teacher and a parent, I know the risks of COVID. The numbers in our county continue to improve while vaccines are made more readily available to us. The science backs up returning to the classroom, and a return to the classroom is what is best for our students emotionally and in terms of their education as well. Thank you, Mark Howard. Public comment number four. Public comment number five. Sana Sharma, Sharma, Colton High School teacher. Good afternoon. Please see my. Good afternoon. As a current high school teacher, I do not feel comfortable going back to in-person learning with a hybrid system in April. Currently, teachers have not been thoroughly informed of how schools will enforce proper social distancing of students, cleaning of classrooms, and discipline procedures. Additionally, the district has not ensured that all willing teachers are able to get vaccinated. The first clinic was already canceled and only 432 vaccine doses are available for the rescheduled clinic. The district needs to respect 
is by providing clear and specific details about how schools will enforce safe and effective in-person learning. I see no proof that in-person learning can happen safely during this school year. Let, let us take more time to create a strong and effective hybrid learning system with safe opportunities for in-person learning embedded within it. Students deserve to be educated in person. They also deserve to be safe and healthy. I don't think our schools are prepared to ensure that our students can return to a hybrid system yet. I do think that a hybrid system can occur with the right protections in place. However, I remember that many classrooms which were never properly cleaned in previous years. Months and months would go by and certain areas of classrooms would hardly be cleaned. Will things really be different? Do schools really have the resources they need to enforce proper procedures to protect students and staff? Why have teachers and families not been informed about them? Please allow us more time to plan for the success of our students. Dr. Seneha Sharma, English teacher, Colton High School. And Shane, I'll go ahead and do board com public comment number five sure, as well. Uh, let me apologize and stop uh, just really uh, uh, Shane, I think the I'm um, getting word that the YouTube uh, sound is not working out there. So, so uh, sorry to stop the here, uh, Dr. Rander. I think that was my microphone that wasn't being picked up. So I think I've got that fixed now, though. Okay, thank you. And and just so everybody's aware, we are recording this, and the recording will be available with full audio as well. Okay, thank thanks. Appreciate that. Okay. Shane, I'll go ahead, go ahead and do public comment number five, and then you could take um, over number six. Um, number five is, public comment number five is from the registered nurses, LVN, and district health assistant of CJUSD. Dear Superintendent Dr. Miranda, Board President Flores, and board members of Colton Joint Unified School District. As the registered nurses, LVN, and district health assistant of CJUSD, we would like to address our concerns with regards to the safety and well-being of students and employees within the district in reopening of schools. Over the past year, we have been involved with following various requirements from recognized agencies, including CDC, CDPH, SBDPH, and California School Nurse Organization, CSNO, with regards to what is needed to be in place in order to reopen schools safely during this pandemic. These are some of the items that we would like you to take into consideration when contemplating reopening for our district on April 5th, 2021. Who will, the, who will man the quarantine area on each of the 29 campuses and will they have their own restroom to use to prevent cross-contamination? Are all the supplies ordered for the quarantine area and has a site chosen where the quarantine area will be set up? Will there be communication devices for the health office and quarantine room in case assistance is needed, such as the AED? Have the schools that have their district nurses working in the health office been given a new location to work as per the plan in order to prevent cross-contamination between campuses since we move from site to site throughout the day? Are there new ventilation systems that have been in place at each of the 29 campus as recommended from CDC? Will there be a plan in place for the nine nurses, one LVN, and health assistants if they go out due to a COVID-19 exposure or illness? What is the planned procedure if a school site has to call 911 from the quarantine room in the event that a parent is not reachable and a child has to be transported to the hospital? Who will be going with the child from the school site or will the current procedure remain that a school site admin will go with the child? Cleaning for all sites, especially considering the health office and quarantine area, what is the plan? We want you to know we are writing this because we have a great deal of students and staff with chronic health conditions that we are worried about. We want to ensure their safety and well-being as well as the general population. Here are some sites to go to for additional information on these topics and what should be done. Thank you so much for taking the time to read this. We appreciate your time and effort that you put into the safety of the staff and students of Colton Joint. Please feel free to reach out to any of us if you have any additional questions. Sabrina Cementi, RN. Christine Gabriel, RN. Christine Whitmire, RN. Kelsey McLaughlin, RN. Jessica Hernandez, RN. Jillian Williams, RN. Christina Dover, RN. Brandy Loyola, RN. Kyla Gardner, RN. Beatrice Ordaz, LVN, Bernice Venegas, District Health Assistant. Shane, you're in public comment number six. 
I actually read number six already, so I think I need to read number four from Dr. Uh, Sneta Sharma. I actually read Sneta Sharma, so you're correct. We are on number seven. Thank you. Do you want me to go ahead and read that one? Yes, please. Sure. Uh, well, Joanne, sorry. Uh, I guess, uh, Shane, uh, YouTube still doesn't have sound. Not not sure if uh, you can address that while Joanne reads that. Yes, I'm checking it right now as well. Thank you. Public comment number seven, Kristen Tornero, Colton High School teacher. Esteemed CJUSD school board members, this has been a challenging year for everyone. This COVID created paradigm shift has demanded that we look at almost everything differently, but in our desire to get back to normal, it is important that we look at the reality of the situation. There are some things to consider. In-person teaching will be nothing like it was before COVID. As a matter of fact, our students will be getting less of our time when they do in our current online format. Teachers have been working to fine tune and focus their curriculum in the current teaching format. Asking them to shift it, shift it yet again will add stress on everyone. The virus is a very real threat to all staff and students. Today we are at 500,000 deaths and counting. In addition, there is a new strain predicted to cause a possible fourth wave of the virus, and it is unclear just how effective the vaccines will be against it. The vaccine, though green-lighted for educators, has proved difficult to get. Many places, such as Kaiser, are not even ready to administer them to teachers. It is also unclear how available the second dose will be for those who get their first shot. Many will have to be just as vigilant in procuring a second appointment as they have had to be in getting the first one. It is for these reasons that I humbly request that you forego returning to brick and mortar in April and revisit our return for the fall. Thank you for your consideration. Christian Tornero, teacher at Colton High. Public comment number eight, Jeremiah Dollins. To our esteemed Colton School Board, the debate about whether or not we should return to school has been ongoing on television, social media, in Zoom calls, and at these meetings. The baseline of every argument, for or against, is that we all, is that we all agree we need to be back at schools. It is what is best for everyone, our kids, their families, our staff, our collective psyches. No one is enjoying distance learning, no one. However, I want to request you keep us in distance learning for the remainder of the year. Why? For a few very simple reasons. One, the schools are not prepared. While the district has purchased tons of PPE and a variety of tools to ensure safety, from plexiglass partitions to touch-free water fountains to spiffy new HVAC systems, the pandemic interruptions have slowed down the speed and efficiency of our maintenance department. Some schools are good to go, but many more still need to be brought up to speed. The students are not prepared. I'm sorry, number two, the students are not prepared. Just switching to a hybrid model after three quarters of distance learning is not as simple as it sounds. The students and their families will need time to adjust to a new schedule that will require some days on campus, some days off campus, plus time devoted to both synchronous and asynchronous learning. It will be overwhelming enough for teachers to adapt to this new paradigm. Our students will struggle too. I'm not sure it is the best time to make these changes so close to the end of the year. The district and union have not come to an agreement yet on hybrid related addendum to the contract. While ACE has had language ready to start negotiations since the fall, the number of negotiation days with the district have unfortunately been few. A negotiation for a return to a hybrid schedule is challenging and time consuming. While it is feasible to get an agreement before April 5th, I fear the delay will result in a, sub a substandard agreement. So while we are all debating the merits of a return to school sites, Please keep these three points in mind. Thank you for your time and consideration. I recognize you are all in a very tough political and personal positions as it relates to returning. I trust you will make the choice that is best for our district. Sincerely, Jeremiah Dollins, teacher, Colton High School. Public comment number nine, Carolyn Kahn, Colton High School teacher. Respected board members, thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts. I'm sure you have all heard that there was a moment of silence recently to mark half a million deaths to COVID-19 in the U.S. Even though this is the reality, I know that people are rushing into decisions in hope that these choices will bring back some normalcy. But unfortunately, this desire to send kids back to school prematurely will have dire consequences. 
Our district does not have the capacity to start in April, and it would be detrimental to go back prematurely. As a teacher at the high school, we often had to clean our own rooms. Teachers were denigrated and criticized when we used our own cleaning supplies before the pandemic. If our classrooms were not cleaned every day pre-pandemic, then how can teachers believe they will be in April? How can you guarantee that our rooms are going to be disinfected every day between periods? If guidelines state that airflow is important, but our windows are painted shut and per district, we are supposed to keep doors locked, how can we guarantee airflow? The district doesn't even support teachers by making cameras on virtual meetings mandatory. How are we going to make masks mandatory? Other districts have this in play and students are held to the standard, while ours are not. Once again, it would be detrimental to go back prematurely and I advocate for a safe return in the fall. Carolyn Kahn, Colton High School. Public comment number 10, Mario Sanchez. Despite other states having less restrictions, despite the science justifying school openings, despite the 77% decrease in COVID in the state, we know that you have no authority to make decisions regarding school closures that supersede the governor's orders. But what have you done for our students? Have you advocated for the use of the track or fields for conditioning? In your authority, have you allowed for the students to have access to school grounds for events outside? like movie nights in the parking lot. You allow students to eat on campus because you deem it essential, yet there is no advocacy or support for students elsewhere. Maybe we submit these public comments for no reason, and maybe we are expressing our concern and asking for permission from the wrong group of people. Believe me, the community will remember this when we return to vote for a new school board and superintendent. Upset and furious. Public comment number 11, Lucy Leva. Colton High School teacher. Esteemed board members, just a few days ago, America hit 500,000 COVID deaths. I teach over 100 students at Colton High. Since August, I've had too many students go to funerals for family members and loved ones who have died as a result of COVID. To be sure, we are in a hot spot. The numbers for San Bernardino County are still purple, meaning that there is a widespread risk. This is not the time to return to brick and mortar. Creating a hybrid schedule and format that will work and keep our students, staff, and community safe will take some time and we should use that time while waiting for our numbers to stop. I implore you to wait until fall to return to brick and mortar. I cannot speak for what happens at other sites, but I know at the high school level, at Colton High especially, returning in April seems futile and unwise. A return in April means putting a rush on preparing the classes, revising bus schedules, working out the details of passing periods, lunches, the list goes on and on. And for what? Starting in April, students begin taking California's CASP exams. Juniors and seniors will take anywhere from one to five weeks taking those exams. Then in May, many students will have two full weeks of AP testing. I just don't see going back as worth it when weighing out the cost and risk. Some may refer to the CDC and use some of their language to imitate that a return is safe. But on February 12th, the CDC published recommendations for reopening brick and mortar schools, and they were firm to say that reopening was not mandatory and that schools should be lulled into a false of safety. The publication mentioned schools going back that were in the blue or yellow zone, but never encouraged those in the purple zone to go back. Once again, we are in the purple still. The publication also implied that middle and high schools should be virtual only unless mitigation strategies can be met. We are not there yet. I love our students. I know you do too. At the end of the day, I think most of us educators want to return to brick and mortar. I see the problems with engagement, with social emotional health, and with low scores. Globally, there is an issue with learning loss there that we will be dealing with for a while, but the bigger cost is in lives. Let's not forget those 500,000. A return to brick and mortar in April is premature. Thank you for your consideration. Lucy Leva, teacher at Colton High School. Public comment number 12, Karen Castillo. Dear board members, please let these kids get back to school. I am concerned about teachers' health, but there has to be a way to do both. So many other schools are open and there have been no massive spreads, very minimal increase in cases and there were no vaccines. What is increasing is depression and suicidal thoughts. Some school districts have seen suicide numbers uptick 300%. If you have not seen it, please look at Clark County in Nevada. 19 kids. If malls and club stores can be open, why can our kids not be in school? 
Can you tell me all teachers who are worried about coming into school have not gone to do any of these things? Have you as board members not started to do more things? I know for a fact some of my daughter's teachers are out doing things. I hear them discuss what they did over the weekend or vacation. There is no reason most teachers cannot be back in the classroom. I have heard it from their own mouth. Please let these kids get back to school. This has been almost a full year. You have had time to plan and get the schools ready. You have known masks and safety measures were going to need to take place. I am sure parents will be happy to help provide supplies if needed. This is not healthy for the kids and the gap is getting farther and farther. I am lucky enough to work from home and support my child through this, but I know she has some friends that are not so lucky. I know there are some that don't even bother getting on. I hear it from the teachers how some kids don't even turn in one assignment. Please think of what is really best for these kids. Karen Arredondo, seventh grade parent. Public comment number 13, Yvette Moda, counselor. Dear Board of Education and Superintendent, I understand the push for in-person instruction, but I would like to share some of the anxieties and consequences this may bring to our community, students, and staff members. I strongly suggest, along with many others who encouraged me to write this, to keep distance learning in place until the rest of the school year. First, many are ignoring that we won't be returning to our school communities in the same way as before. What I mean by this is expectations, guidelines, connections, and the way we taught and related will not be the same. For example, everything from lunch to recess and group will be impacted. We all wish to go back to normal, but the way we did things before won't work the same way. The way we interact will be inhibited, and I wonder if that will be more damaging for students and staff's mental health. All of us had to reinvent the wheel last spring, staff, families, students, the entire district. As challenging as distance learning is, that is what we've created through lots of trial and error, mistakes and successes. To go back for solely two months, we should consider what that will actually look like. The first month, if not more, will be spent learning new protocols and school guidelines and expectations. We will once again have to reinvent the wheel and do it twice or multiple times because of cohorts, except only for two months because then it will be summer again. Individually and as a society, we are craving normalcy and routine. But going back to new schedules and cohorts is not a normal routine and will bring many unexpected challenges that I'm not sure we'll have the support for due to safety distancing guidelines. Secondly, I think we should consider the anxiety that going back will and is currently manifesting in students and staff. I've heard from many students that they wonder if they will still have friends and have gotten and have forgotten how to make friends. These are real fears about going back and interacting with their own peers who they've known for years. This brings me back to my first point that even the way students will make friends will be different and they will need the social, emotional support and relational time to make connections with peers and staff in new ways. I wonder how I'm going to be able to support my students if they are having a crisis and need emotional support. How will staff members, myself included, address crisis situations when a student is in danger to themselves or others and keep a six foot distance? I would like to add that staff has experienced high anxiety levels regarding whether or not we should or are returning to in-person teaching. Many worry for the safety of our small communities and own families. Many worry for the students and families that have lost loved ones due to COVID and those in our own lives. As I speak with more of my staff and colleagues, I see how hard we are working at keeping our own mental health afloat and adding more changes and uncertainties will be taxing on our well-being. I tell my students' parents to care for themselves and be well so that they can healthily support their children. We must ask ourselves if we are properly supporting staff well-being so that we can teach and interact healthily with our, younger, with our young learners. Public comment number 14, Camille Butts, CJUSD teacher. I write in full support of the staff proposal. In consideration of the safety of CJUSD staff, students and families and the continuity of our educational program, the district recommends that distance learning remain in effect through the end of the 2020-2021 academic school year. I want to thank Mr. Dan Flores, Ms. Bertha Aragin, Ms. Joanne Thoring Ojeda, Mr. Israel Fuentes, Ms. Pat Haro, Mr. Frank A. Ibarra, Ms. Berenice Sandoval for prioritizing the health and safety of all students, staff and community members during this time. I want to commend district staff and leadership, ACE leadership, and CSEA leadership. Your work to provide evidence-based recommendations 
resources, and supports that intersect the safety of all stakeholders and the education of our students to the Executive Cabinet, Board of Education, and the greater Colton Joint USD community has proven that you value a safe, efficient, and equitable return to in-person school. As you all know, school never stopped. It simply changed form to protect the health and vital life-saving resources of our community. As February continues, I want to take this time to thank everyone participating in Black Lives Matter Week. If you have not yet participated, it is never too late to highlight, uplift, and affirm the rich history and contributions of the Black community, to educate all stakeholders, and to cultivate in Black students a sense of pride, self-worth, and self-love. Please check out the APAC website for more info. Because of our collective efforts to reduce COVID spread, get vaccinated, and plan for the future, I know we will be ready for a safe, efficient, and equitable return to in-person school. I look forward to hearing action item 4.1, approval to remain in distance learning through June 4th, 2021, is passed unanimously. Regards, Ms. Camille Butts. Public comment number 15, it concerns parents. CJUSD board members and district. As a parent of two children in the district, I'd like to see CJUSD remain in distance learning. I know many parents have spoken out that those who do not feel safe can keep their children home. However, do these parents know that children in middle school and high school will not have the same credentialed teachers? These students will be forced into the Odyssey program. I do not feel that this program is equitable in offering the same quality education my children are receiving through the current distance learning. I am grateful to the teachers and for the education my children are currently receiving. I do not feel that it is beneficial to change for the last nine weeks of school. Most students will have to be in online in school completing the CAF state testing during these weeks and time will be taken away from learning because teachers will, teachers will have to teach new rules and procedures. Also, if the students return and the number of cases rises, there is a greater chance that schools will have to begin the next school year with distance learning. I know the number of cases has gone down in the area. We need to do our part to keep those numbers on the decline so that the district can hopefully open up safely in the 2021-22 school year. Sincerely, a concerned parent of two Terrace Hills Middle School students. Public comment 16. Good afternoon. I am emailing you in regards to students returning to school. I think it is a horrible plan to have us students return to school right now. I am a junior that attends Colton High School, and as a student, I would like to finish out this year doing distance learning. I know that you as a board member or administrator wants us to get back to school in person, but you are not thinking about the health of the students. It is more important for students to be safe at home than in school. I think you would be saving us students and yourselves a lot of stress. I think we would all be happy to attend school the following school year instead of being at school for three months and going back on summer break. Respectfully, it would, it would be a waste of time. As students, we have mental health problems and pushing us to go back to school right now is hard. Also, I love my teachers and I would hate for them to have to teach so many classes online and in person for those students that choose not to go back if we do. I think you would be making the best decision if you chose to finish out this school year and have us attend next school year when it is much safer. This is coming for me and many other students that attend CHS. Thank you and hopefully you, you found a better perspective from us students. Ros Rosita Gutierrez. Public comment number 17, Sam Gayo, Bloomington High School teacher. To the Board of Education, I feel that if the state of California will allow our district to open camp campuses to students, we should. I also believe that parents, students, and staff should have the option to educate from home. During this pandemic, choice has been eliminated. If a parent wants their child to stay at home and distance learn, then that should happen with the teacher who also feels it is unsafe to return but also a parent should be able to choose to send their child to school and be taught by a teacher who also chooses to teach in a classroom. Because of my daughter's travel softball team, I have been to Idaho, Arizona, Nevada, and Utah during the pandemic. These states have stayed open and, ha and have allowed sports to continue. Utah and Idaho especially have had students in school with busing. It just seems that if a state is allowing daily life to occur, then it should be an option for us. I am willing to abide by whatever decision is made by our board whether we stay at home with distance learning, try hybrid, or go back. I do hope that parents, students, and teachers are given the choice to decide for themselves. Some students gravely need to come back. Others are fine with distance learning. Some of us teachers want to return, while others feel it is too risky. 
I say let them choose if the state is allowing it. Thank you for your time and for the hard decisions you must make. Respectfully, Sam Gilo, Bloomington High School Visual Arts. It's time to switch our sign language interpreters. Give me just a second, please. Public comment 18, Gloria Lopez. Dear Board President Flores, Board Members, Superintendent Miranda, I am a retired teacher of CJUSD. I would like to thank you for keeping my daughter and grandchild safe during this pandemic by using distance learning. My daughter is a teacher at Joe Baca Middle School and my granddaughter is a student at Grimes Elementary. My granddaughter is in the dual immersion program. I urge you to, keep, to continue to keep the students and staff in distance learning for the remainder of this school year for their safety. Personally, we have lost close friends to this pandemic and we hope the new school year will be, a safe, will be safer for our loved ones. We are not safe yet. Thank you, Maria Gloria Lopez. Public comment number 19, Eva Hernandez, Colton High School teacher on assignment. Good evening, CJUSD School Board. My name is Eva Hernandez. My second grader and kindergarten attend Coley Ranch Elementary. I work as a math teacher on assignment at Colton High School. We have been working and learning remotely for almost one year. Ensuring we stay healthy and steer clear of the coronavirus has been a motivator for making staying at home work. While our county has st started distributing the vaccine and our infection numbers are dropping, April 5th is not the right time to bring us back to the physical classroom. I would like to encourage you to wait until August 2021. My boys are finally feeling some stability with distance learning, especially my kindergartner. I would hate to see them have to relearn new routines for just 10 weeks of school. While I know I don't speak for all families, I do know several who are going back physically in April but just add a whole new layer of stress to an already stressful situation. I feel like we are st starting to enter the eye of this awful storm and that we are not 100% prepared to re-enter the storm in hybrid mode. We need to make sure we have clear agreements and expectations for and between all stakeholders so we can bring back all of our students when it is safe to do so. What evidence do we have to show that it is safe to do so? I hope that you all do what is in the best interest of all of our stakeholders and let's stay home 10 more weeks. Public comment number 20 from Lorena. Dear Dr. Miranda and board members, Last night, I looked at the agenda and presentation for tonight's meeting. I just wanted to briefly thank you for a thorough and well put together presentation. I am pleased with the board's recommendation to stay in distance learning because I know that ultimately you want to keep your teachers, staff, and our students safe. With that being said, I'd like to also bring to your attention something else I learned yesterday. Mr. Tony Thurmond, our state superintendent, made a statement regarding standardized testing. He stated, Standardized tests are imperfect measures at best and often provide snapshots of student performance that are far too narrow to help educators in any given year, let alone during a once in a lifetime global pandemic. Most years, the results of statewide testing simply reflect the deep and systemic inequities that have placed generations of students at a historic ongoing academic disadvantage. Those are the students whose families have been hit hardest by COVID-19 households in poverty and communities of color. And every resource dedicated to taking a test is a resource that could be better spent on helping students recover from this crisis and accelerate learning. Even as more schools reopen in the weeks and months ahead, it seems unlikely that there is enough time to meaningfully prepare our students for statewide tests. Please consider taking the recommendations of our state superintendent and not require or issue any standardized testing this year. It would help take stress off of our students, families, and teachers. Thank you for consideration, Mrs. Nichols and concerned parents. Public comment number 21 is from an anonymous parent. Dear school board members, as a parent of a CJUSD, I know you have a very important decision to make tonight. I support the action item to remain in distance learning through the end of the school year. I know our students need to get back in the classroom, but to do this at the end of the school year will only create a mess Currently, my child is on the hybrid schedule, but with COVID testing not happening as much because of the vaccination rollout and spring break quickly approaching, I am not comfortable sending him back to school. 
So what are my options? What is a plan for those in a hybrid class who trust that safety is a top priority, not state testing, end of the year testing, or the huge dollar amount attached to opening up? My child is not a dollar amount nor a lab rat for unnecessary testing, either as any student or family in this district. Yes, as a parent, I will be opting my student out of state testing, but that does not take him out of all the district mandated testing. So if we return, does that force me to send my student back to school? This is a possibility because I don't want him changing teachers into a distance learning class, or even worse, as a secondary student into Odyssey program that is replacing class instruction. With the child with needs, it took him the first quarter to get used to things and now he is thriving, only to have these, this all change if we open up. I know this is not the case for everyone, but I would prefer to start fresh next year with a new way of doing school. Thank you for your time and work. Anonymous. Public comment number 22, Julia Fearnquist. Dear board members, first, I would like to commend the school board and all involved, and thank you for listening to parents and for actively working to make the best decisions for our children during a very unprecedented time. I appreciate this. It isn't an easy time. My name is Julia Fearnquist, and I am a parent to 11-year-old fifth grade twins at Terrace View Elementary School. I am currently a stay-home stay mom, but previously served in primary education for over 20 years. I am writing today because I am concerned about the upcoming state testing. I do not understand that we, I, I'm sorry, I do understand that we, CJUSD, need to know how our children are doing and how to help them, especially after remote learning. But I also know that there are other ways to measure or determine that, and I am hopeful teachers already know this by now. State testing, in my opinion, will create further stress and panic with students who are already feeling so much pressure. At this point in the year, many students are already struggling with remote learning. They may just check out on state testing. Internet has been spotty as well. Some require accommodations. All require some type of supervision during testing for legality. I just feel terrible for our children to be in this position, and I have an uncomfortable feeling that this testing will not be fair or accurate, considering the inequities of the circumstances. If the testing outcome is to measure where, where they are and how to help them recover from this year, there really may be other ways to determine this, right? I could be wrong and maybe reacting on my own emotion taken from watching my children and how their self-esteem and confidence has been hit and shattered from the struggles of remote learning. I know that during remote learning, our children missed a lot of instruction that would have occurred in person and the test will reflect that. This is more of a concern than how it is administered. I would prefer to see the state testing waived this year. If CJUSD is required to proceed regardless of the inequities children faced with remote learning, and CJUSD determines it to be in the very best interest of every child to administer the testing with the purpose of developing a plan of action to help students recover academically, then I will proceed in full support of the school as a parent. Thank you for your time. Julia Fiernquist. Public comment number 23, Katherine Brown, Ruth O'Hare Ruth O'Harris Middle School teacher. Esteemed superintendent and members of the board, when considering plans for the safe reopening of our schools, the cases per 100,000 residents of the county has been the metric that has been used. I would like to draw your attention to another metric that I believe is much more meaningful to our community, our families, and our students, and that is the youth cases. Many people pushing for the hasty opening of schools say that children are not affected by the COVID-19 virus and that they do not spread it to any degree. However, the county's dashboard schools page shows that our, district, that our school district alone has 2,415 cases in children between the ages of 5 and 19. For the week of February 7th through the 13th, 37 children were infected in our district. In neighboring Fontana, 100 children were infect, infected that week. These numbers show definitely that our students are being affected by COVID in significant numbers, even as we keep them safe at home. Imagine the impact of having them gather together with others outside of their households frequently. For the health and safety of our students, families, and community, I urge you to continue distance learning through the end of this school year. Thank you, Katherine Brown, teacher, Ruth O'Harris Middle School. Public comment number 24. Michelle Norris. Dear board members, I am requesting that you open back our schools. My two teens, along with all other children of the Colton Joint Unified School District, have now been out of school one year. 
it is time for distance learning to come to an end and start our kids' life again. In-person instruction and interaction with teachers and friends is crucial to these kids' mental health. The mental effects of the lockdown have been horrendous. According to the San Bernardino County website, no school-aged children have died. Studies are showing, including guidance from the CDC, that opening schools is safe and recommended. I implore you. I have two honor students, however, the mental implications from this lockdown will take years to recover from. It is now time to move forward and do what is best for our kids. Open the schools. Thank you, Michelle Norris. Public comment number 25, Christina Cabrera, speech pathologist. Dear school board members, my name is Christina Cabrera and I'm a speech pathologist for the district. I would like to take the opportunity to share with you that our speech department has diligently been meeting the needs of our students and has concerns over altering our complex schedule for the remainder of the year, as well as concerns for crossover exposure of schools and students, which would negatively impact our department and students. Our speech department is currently serving, servicing students with remote speech therapy. In addition, we have an in-person assessment team completing evaluations as well as all speech pathologists completing virtual assessments and alternative testing assessments remotely. We are proud to share with the board that we have been actively completing direct speech therapy to students since the, re since the return from spring break last year with one week of training and rescheduling. Our caseload averages 55 students, which include both hybrid tracks and distance learning students. In our speech department, 63% of our speech pathologists cover at least two schools and six out of 27 speech pathologists access multiple sites in order to complete bilingual speech testing. Furthermore, we utilize seven speech paraprofessionals for our speech therapy services who service five different schools per week. If our schools were to reopen, one speech pathologist would have to reschedule for potentially six different student tracks. For instance, school one, hybrid A, hybrid B and distance learning students, and school two, hybrid A, hybrid B and distant learning. At this time, with concerns over pulling students out for small speech groups from multiple classrooms and the potential crossover exposure at different schools, we ask for your support in remaining distance learning for the rest of the school year. We also request if we, if we were to move to an in-person hybrid plan, that speech caseloads would be adjusted for the safety of students, staff, and schools. Respectfully submitted, Christina Cabrera, speech language pathologist. Public comment number 26. Good evening, board members, Superintendent Miranda, and all watching on YouTube. My name is Molly Green, and I have been a teacher in CJUSD for the past 14 years. First, I want to thank the district and the school board for consistently making decisions to keep our students and our community safe. Distance learning is not ideal and certainly not fun for anyone, but we are in the middle of a global pandemic and I applaud CJUSD and the school board for making hard decisions this year. I urge you to continue to put health and safety first and not rush to open campus. I know that people learn best in a classroom setting, but going back while the virus is still raging will put our entire community at risk and it will not be school as usual. Initially, a hybrid schedule sounds good, but once examined, it is a logistical nightmare that will create more difficulties for all stakeholders. Elementary students would be based on the I'm sorry. Elementary students would, based on the proposed hybrid plan from December, come to school two mornings a week for three hours. The entire rest of the week, they would be synchronously or asynchronously online. All of us, whether we are teachers, staff, students, or parents, we want to return to campus but we have to remember that a return right now would not be business as usual. Staff and teachers won't be able to interact with, our with, interact with or teach students in the normal fashion. We all need to be wearing masks. We'll need to keep six feet apart. So that means no pair activities, no group work, no greeting students as they enter the school or classroom. We won't even be able to stand next to a student when they need help with an assignment. We'll have to problem solve from across the room. And those are just the social teaching aspects of hybrid. What about the PPE needs for each school and each teacher and staff member? And the cleaning protocols. My understanding is that it has taken eight months to get three sites ready. How can all sites be ready by April 5th? I know we have concerns about the emotional and mental health of students. As best we can, teachers are including social emotional learning and activities daily in our distance learning classes. We all want this pandemic to end and to be able to go back to school. I promise you, every teacher wants that. 
but we need to do it when it is safe and normal as possible. Not just for everyone's health, but because that means we can truly go back to school. Lunches, recess, normal teaching, students hanging out and playing together. I asked the board to consider extending distance learning to the end of the 2020-21 school year, June 4th. Yours sincerely, sincerely, Molly Green, teacher, GTHS. Public comment 27 will be read out by our translator, Cynthia Bueno. This message is from a concerned parent. Her name is Elena Lam. Um, she says, Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Elena y quiero dar mi opinión acerca de reabrir las escuelas. Es importante que los niños regresen a las aulas y sé cuánto trabajo les está costando este encierro. Pero a pesar de eso, pienso que todavía no es seguro regresar a nuestros hijos a las clases uh, pres en presencia. La gente cree que porque han bajado los casos y están aplicando vacunas, ya pueden andar como si el virus se esfumó, pero no. Todavía está entre nosotros y es muy importante estar consciente de esto y ser responsables. Me gustaría que se detengan un poco y piensen en toda esa gente que desgraciadamente ha perdido a sus seres queridos y tantos niños que han quedado huérfanos. Espero que cuando se tome la decisión de reabrir las escuelas sea porque ya están preparados y se han tomado precauciones extremas y verdaderamente no hay peligro de lamentaciones. Mi, mi humilde opinión, gracias. It says, good evening, my name is Elena and I want to share my opinion about the reopening of our schools. It's important that, that students return back to classrooms. I know how difficult the school closures have been on our students, but despite it, I believe that it is still not safe for our children to return to their in-person classes. People believe that because the cases have dropped and they are administering vaccines, that we can go, uh, go about as if the virus has vanished but no it's still among us and it is very important to remain aware of it and to be responsible i would love for you to halt for a bit and to consider all the people who have unfortunately lost loved ones and so many children who have now been orphaned i hope that when you make this decision to reopen schools that it will be because you uh, you are prepared have taken extreme precautions and there really is no real uh danger of lamentations this is only my humble opinion thank you Thank you, Cynthia. Public comment number 28, Rita Aros, teacher. Good afternoon, board members. I am writing in support of continuing distance learning through the 2021 school year. Until every employee who wishes to get a COVID-19 vaccine is able to obtain one, whether by their own means or that of the district. As much as I want to return to my happy, colorful classroom and in-person teaching, I would only feel safe doing so with the knowledge that this district and board have done everything within their power to ensure the health and safety of, the, of all stakeholders. At the top of the priority list should be making sure that every adult who wants a vaccine can get one. I would never feel comfortable going back to work and risk exposing my 73-year-old mother who lives with me to the COVID virus. It would be devastating. Lastly, I hope every school site has had an opportunity at the table as far as the COVID safety plan for reopening is concerned. Slover is on a multi-use district site that we have shared for the past several years with Adult Ed, Head Start, PPS, the boardroom, and MNO for storage. How does the COVID safety plan address multi-use district sites? Will they be clear, cleaned more often? Will entry points be more stringent and closely monitored? Will anyone have unfettered access? If so, why? Who will make sure COVID safety protocols are followed properly? I hope these types of concerns for multi-use sites are given serious consideration in the COVID safety plan for reopening and addressing how now rather than later when it would be too late. Thank you for your time. Respectfully, Rita Alos. Joanne, can you also read um, number 29? Sure, absolutely. Public comment number 29, Lisa Villa, employee. Good evening. As I read over tonight's board agenda, I saw that item 3.1, there was a distance learning presentation to be given by the executive cabinet, which leads me to believe that there will be an elaborate and professional slideshow and presentation to emphasize the pros of distance learning within our district. 
that is from your eyes. Then I saw on the following agenda item where it says the approval for distance learning for the remainder of the 2020-21 school year. So technically the plan to do distance learning for the remainder of this school year was always that. For you to lead the students and parents into thinking that you were actually and actively working hard on a plan for our students to safely return to school. When you knew all along that you weren't going to is completely disrespectful to give us false hope knowing all along you weren't going to let the students come back. Some of the clues that lead me to believe you had no intentions of returning students to campus are that you already had this special board meeting for today, February 24th, to decide on the students being able to physically come back safely to campus. But instead, the executive cabinet was actively working on a distance learning presentation for tonight, so it can be on the agenda for approval. Another clue that you knew all along is that you have not done any preparations within the classrooms. There is no rush because you already planned on not coming back until the next school year. The fact that you built up the idea that you were possibly thinking of letting students return to campus and you weren't is fraud. It is a complete shame. We as parents would like to virtually see all the progress that you have made in each of the classrooms to prepare for a safe return. We don't want to see the prototype of what you plan on doing. We want to see the whole year of preparations within the classrooms that you have been working on in our schools. How are other districts able to open safely and not us? It's because they were prepared and they had leaders who care about students and community. The CDC says that TK through six is eligible to return now, even if they are in the purple tier, as long as the district has done all the necessary preparations to make that happen. So are our TK through sixth graders coming back? My question is, what has actually been done to prepare this whole past year? Respectfully, Lisa Villa. Public comment number 30, Lori Walton. Good evening, President Flores, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Miranda, and the team of district office staff. It is with great relief and optimism that I write to you this evening to express my gratitude and support for your vote to approve action item 4.1 the approval to remain in distance learning until June 4th, 2021. In reviewing the public documents of the presentation, I am deeply appreciative of the work staff and their teams have done to provide a comprehensive overview of the state of our district in COVID. The presentation reveals a deep compassion and commitment to our collective health and wellness. It also makes visible a growing awareness of the power of transparency and a rumbling with the questions that an equity mindset will always provoke. I am proud to be a community member of the CJUSD. I want to also acknowledge our students, families, and my colleagues in all the spaces where I think and work for their determination, their perseverance, and their love of one another to make the best out of what has been a most painful experience. It has changed and will continue to shape me and our CJUSD community. Please stay, st please stay safe and well all. Lori Walton, mathematics teacher, Ruth O'Harris Middle School. Public comment number 31, Rebecca Carrillo, Zimmerman teacher. Dear members of the board, first of all, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to voice my opinion regarding school openings. I am a teacher who wants to return to in-person instruction. Distance learning has been challenging for teachers, but most of all to students. As a teacher, it is difficult to not be able to, te to really teach. Yes, I may be working harder and longer hours, but I'm not really teaching. Teaching is so much more than giving students information through a screen. It involves checking for understanding, allowing time for collaborative conversations, and teaching students to learn by doing. All of these are effective research-based strategies which have lost their effectiveness through distance learning. But students are having a harder time. Most of my students are struggling to keep up with grade level standards than ever before. And as a parent, I know the toll it has taken on the academic success and mental health of my own children. I urge you to consider reopening our district schools safely this 2020-2021 school year. I am ready and willing to return to the classrooms as soon as possible. Thank you for your time. Rebecca Carillo, fourth grade teacher, Walter Zimmerman Elementary. And that concludes public comments. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Shane, for um, helping us with that. We had quite a few public comments today, and I want to thank everybody that participated and submitted comments today. Again, as always, 
Um, it's important to us to get that feedback. And for those whose comments ran beyond the three minutes, we do have a complete copy of all of tonight's comments. And that's something the board has provided to in advance of the meeting. So thank you for that. Okay, uh, Mr. Superintendent, at this time, we will go to the next item on the agenda, uh, which is a comprehensive presentation that you put together with your team about um, distance learning, uh, as well as uh, the potential impacts uh, with respect to uh, hybrid learning. There's a lot to unpack in this. It's a long presentation, with a lot of detailed information. So we appreciate you doing this, not only for the board, but for the community. And we'll make a note just for the board, um, board members, uh, we have a number of our cabinet members giving sections uh, of the presentation. I think probably the most efficient way to handle that, Dr. Miranda, is to allow each um, each individual to provide their section. And then at the end, we'll pause there and see if there are questions for that particular um, presenter and the section that they've addressed. And we'll do that for each one. And of course, we'll always have questions and comments at the end of the presentation. Given the length and the, and the detail, I wanted to make sure that we had moments uh, in between the pause after each presentation to ask questions, allow the board to provide some input or ask questions. Is that fair? Uh, that sounds good, uh, board president, and I'd advise uh, executive cabinet uh, to please pause after their uh, section and take questions, comments from the board, and then uh, we'll do that at the end. So that sounds, uh, that sounds like a good process, and we certainly will be uh, doing that tonight. Excellent. All right. Well, uh, with that being the case, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you, Dr. Miranda, to go ahead and lead us off for uh, tonight's presentation. Thank you, uh, Board President, and good evening, uh, Board members, Executive Cabinet, uh, staff, all the members of the public. Uh, I am pleased tonight uh, with Executive Cabinet. Uh, we've been working diligently uh, on this uh, distance learning plan for uh, many months now, to be honest with you. I've been mean, going back to uh, June of 2020, and then we provided an update in December. And so this is our third update uh, in distance learning and the reopening of schools for our district since uh, uh, last year. So uh, we we are pleased to present uh, this updated 2021 uh, reopening plan uh, for the board's consideration. And I'm sure there'll be uh, quite a bit of questions and and uh, so we are, we'll be ready to answer those. So, uh, I wanted to start uh, so we can move on to the next slide, please, Shane. Really talk about the process, because I think the process is ex really important to talk about how do we arrive at a decision or a recommendation uh, for the board. Uh, and so that's uh, really the process has continually evolved uh, as guidelines have changed, as the circumstances have changed in our, in our district since March of 2022, when we first got into uh, uh, distance learning. Uh, and basically shut down our district. Uh, we've approached this process uh, uh, with uh, our theory of action uh, in mind. In other words, we are committed uh, to providing uh, evidence-based recommendations based on data, resources, and supports that combine uh, the safety of all our stakeholders and the education of our students. Uh, be, safety uh, being a priority as the board has directed us. So by collaborating with our numerous stakeholders throughout the process, there's been hundreds of people have been involved with this process. So it hasn't just been executive cabinet, uh, the reopening task force consists of over 200 people. So, uh, and then uh, working with them, teachers, classified folks, uh, and, and many of you uh, uh, are part of this process. So we were able to provide a recommendation from executive cabinet to our board of trustees, and also uh, the greater community here, the CGC community that is not only Grand Terrace, or excuse me, Colton, but it's Grand Terrace, Colton, Bloomington, parts of Fontana, and a little bit of uh, Rialto. So we can honestly uh, keep uh, a consideration and, and affect, uh, we know that our recommendations affect the safety of our community. So. Uh, we want to uh, be a, uh, provide a recommendation that uh, provides avenue for safety, efficiency, and, and really important for us, an equitable return to our schools. So I uh, wanted to just uh, talk a little bit about our, our reopening process and our theory. Uh, so the next slide, please. So a big uh, uh, discussion, and, I, and I've heard in the, the comments, uh, a lot of the uh, comments were uh, in regards to the guidance and, and the tiers and, and where we're at. 
So first I thought I'd uh, review the San Bernardino County reopening guidance. Uh, and so a lot of you are familiar with uh, the now uh, the tier system that uh, we have here, not only in our county, but across the state. Uh, so all of you are familiar with the purple, red, uh, orange, and then yellow tiers. And, uh, and this is really the guidance that we follow when it comes to reopening schools. Uh, and, and so we're under this uh, system, this county-wide system here in Summer County, which is made up of 33 districts. So as, there, as uh, many of you have mentioned tonight, uh, we are still uh, currently in that purple tier. Now, uh, I think it's important to note that uh, uh, last year, uh, uh, if we were, uh, we had to reach that seven per 100,000 to reopen schools. Now, the, just recently, the new guidance that was, uh, uh, was changed by the governor said that once uh, we reach the uh, 25 per 100,000 for five consecutive days, then uh, K, uh, elementary schools or K through kindergarten through sixth grade schools uh, can, can open in small cohorts, uh, meaning that we, we, we can open K through six, but uh, we'd still have to maintain the guidance of six feet distance uh, and so that obviously provides some challenges there. Nevertheless, uh, uh, the county has met, met that threshold and that met, the, uh, met that, uh, I believe that was on February 19th when the county's uh, rates, positivity rates, fell below 25 per 100,000 for five consecutive days. And we received word that uh, schools K through six may reopen not uh, so that means there was a local it, it is still a local decision by a school district uh, and so we're still we're, we're calling it the lavender uh, color because it's still uh, widespread so in other words uh, we still are considered uh, to be uh, widespread uh, still high risk in the county uh, even though we're uh, below that 25 per 100,000 uh, and so I want to make it very clear that under this guidance, only K through six uh, schools, elementary schools can uh, can open. So uh, middle schools and high schools, uh, for those to be open, we have to get below the seven per 100,000. Uh, again, uh, I was in a meeting with the Department of Health yesterday, uh, the Cohen Porter, and we asked uh, when do we think we're gonna get to that? And uh, we're still uh, pretty, uh, the, the according to the data, we're still far away from that threshold. So uh, again, there is uh, some misunderstanding out there, confusion. Uh, I think some people think that because we're below 25 or the county is below 25, then we can reopen all schools K through 12. And that is not the case. At this time, only K through six uh, schools can, uh, can reopen. Uh, and, but that's based on county-wide data. So I wanted to uh, for, talk about the county-wide. So, and, and that's good that overall the county-wide, the positive rates are dropping. So uh, let's uh, dig a little bit deeper into that and, and let me impact some of this here. So let's get to the next slide, please. So this is the county uh, dashboard, uh, San Bernardino County COVID-19 dashboard. And we use this, uh, I'd say almost on a daily basis at the district to help us uh, look at the data, drive the decisions we make. And so uh, many of you are familiar with this dashboard. Uh, in fact, uh, COVID, uh, the S San Marino COVID-19 uh, is available to all folks in the community. You can go to there and, and you see the countywide numbers. I'm not gonna get into all the, the district or the countywide numbers because I wanna focus on, on Colton, our district numbers. But again, I wanted to show you this so that you know that we, we do get our numbers from the county. Uh, they're provided by the county uh, on a weekly basis, updated uh, uh, at 12 o'clock on Monday. So we, we look forward to the numbers and, and really uh, look at those. Next slide, please. So uh, what I wanna focus on in terms of the dashboard is uh, our district. So very clearly you see there, and this is uh, the latest, uh, number we just pulled uh, uh, from, the, from the county. Uh, we're still in the purple tier, that we, meaning that we're still uh, at a widespread uh, risk. Uh, so, uh, but our number is district-wide 
that is below the 25 per 100,000 disregard. The week before that, we were at 31.2, so that we saw a drop. Uh, so, uh, and so I, I wanted to show you that. So this is what we looked at look at on a weekly basis, but we're still in that purple tier, uh, meaning that the positivity rates are still high in our district overall. Uh, there's still a high uh, widespread risk in our district. Now, next slide, please. So I wanted to also narrow it down specifically to our different communities that Colton uh, Joint uh, Unified is made up of. So, uh, and I think it's important to, to really look at our communities because when we talk about an equitable return for all students, we really need to uh, look at our, our communities. So when you look at uh, Bloomington, Colton, and we have schools in Fontana, so we need to look at them and then Grand Terrace, obviously, we see that Bloomington, the daily uh, cases per 100,000 are still well above the 25. They're, in fact, they're currently at 35.9 per 100,000. Uh, Colton is, a, is right around 25, uh, 24.6. Fontana, when we look at Fontana, 25.9, the schools that are, are, you know, that are in Fontana. And then Grand Terrace is about 16.1. So the, this uh, data is from the week of uh, February 7th through the 13th. Uh, and again, I just want to state that when we look at this data, uh, we used to inform our decisions for uh, the return of staff or our planning for a return of students. Uh, even though the county has met the threshold to begin reopening at the elementary level, uh, we're using the data within our communities to develop recommendations that ensure the safety of all our students, not just not just some. As you can see, two of our uh, our communities, again, like I stated, continues to exceed well above the 25 per 100,000 or Bloomington or is above uh, the, the 25 per 100,000 and especially Bloomington. We've always made decisions as a district, as one district, and uh, we will continue to make recommendations that keep the safety of our entire district in consideration. Uh, so let me also just state this. Yesterday I was in a meeting with the, uh, the Department of Health uh, director uh, of the Department of Health is uh, Mr. Cohen Porter, and he very, he made a statement that I wanted to share that uh, our he said that our region and, and our county here continues to be high risk, uh, and and here's why because uh, of the new uh, UK variant that exists and it's been identified in our county. So does that mean the numbers are going to uh, rise again? Uh, obviously, we don't know that. But when, when he said that, uh, obviously, uh, really uh, set an alarm in, in me. And, and um, I wanted to state that because that's coming from the Department of Health uh, director. So again, very clearly, there's still a high risk that exists in, in our county, in our district. And now we have a new variant uh, that, that exists. So we still have to be uh, very cautious and again, uh, and ensuring keeping our folks safe. Next slide. So I've, I've talked a lot about data, and, and it's really important that I make this point because it's used to uh, drive our decisions as a district, as an executive cabinet, uh, and as a board. Uh, so it, it's been used quite a bit, uh, or, or I've talked a lot of it right now, because we're using it for the planned return of a hybrid instructional model. So we, we use not only the county dashboard that I've talked about, uh, but also we, we're using the guidance from the California Department of Education for a safe return. We're using the uh, California Blueprint for a Safer Economy, uh, which gives us some guidance there. And also the COVID-19 industry guidance for schools, which comes from the, the Department of Public Health uh, from the state, and then again the dashboard. So that that is uh, a, quite a bit of uh, guidance and information, and and uh, that we uh, process uh, in our in our and staff does in our executive cabinet, the directors, the principals. We all uh, we all really look at all this this data and guidance to try to make the best recommendation to our board of education when it comes to the safety not only of our students but also uh, of our uh, employees. So next slide, please. So speaking of uh, employees, 
you know, we when we're talking about reopening our sites, we we obviously focus on our students' safety and their return. But we also need to consider our staff, our employees. We we have over 2,200 employees in our district, uh, so we also need to consider their uh, their safety uh, and their return. And so uh, we've put together many timelines, and we've had to scale them back and shut down our district at times because of the high numbers that exist. So now uh, we're in the process, in fact, this week to uh, increasing our classified staff, uh, the number of days that they're actually on site uh, and opening up to the public. I know there's been some concerns about that. So now we're open Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, three days a week to the public, eight to 12. Uh, and we're allowing teachers to, to return back to their classrooms those three days because that's also when administrators are, are there. Uh, so you see that the progression of the timeline uh, that we're March 1st, because our numbers uh, seem are, are decreasing in terms of the positivity rates, we're gonna go to five days a week. And so now we'll allow teachers to come back five days. Now, allowing the teachers to come back, that's, a, uh, that's not mandatory. Uh, that's uh, if they uh, if they would like to come back and teach from the classroom, we, we made that available to them. So those classrooms uh, are ready. Uh, and so we we do emphasize again, I'll, and I just want to make this point very clear that we want to keep our employees safe. There's still guidelines that exist out there for in-person meetings. The, the county has is not allowing group meetings. Uh, in fact, uh, they, they have not allowed us to have uh, large gatherings. So a lot of you are wondering about, for example, graduations and, and things like that. So at this point, we're, we're still not allowed to do that. So uh, we are phasing in our staff, You're, more staff, you're seeing more on campus, uh, we're open to the public. Uh, and, and it's again, it's all based on the data, based on keeping not only um, our, our students safe, but our employees safe. Uh, we don't want our employees to get sick. Uh, later on in the presentation, you're going to get, um, we're going to provide some information regarding the vaccines, because that's another big step in, in the safety in offering that. So, uh, I will, uh, at this point, uh, Board President, uh, before I turn it over to Mr. Jensen, who is going to get into uh, more of the uh, facilities piece, uh, I'll take any questions at this point since uh, I think that we decided that this would probably be the best break and I could catch my breath and <laughs> answer some questions on that. So, certainly. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Miranda. And what I'll do at this time is I'll open it up to board members uh, for questions specific to Dr. Miranda's uh, presentation that he just uh, provided. I have a question or a comment. Please, Board Member Thorne, ahead. Dr. Miranda, thank you so much. You covered a great deal of material and, and made it very, um, well, as much as we can easily to understand. Um, one of the things that I heard um, on the media the other day helped me understand a little better because people are hearing, oh, it's we're so much better. Our numbers are going down. And even though we're widespread, they're going down. And, one of the comments that was made was, yes, we're going down, but let's not forget the numbers we are actually at are still where they were in the summer of last year. And if you recall, they were really high then. So they were high then, but they got really high, but now we're back to that level. So when you say it's widespread, it's it's still very widespread. Um, and, and and it's easy. We're hoping that with all the, the vaccines coming out that oh, we're going to be free and clear. And I think this is a time that we really need to take lots of caution. So I, I that helped me understand it. But what you, this presentation today, I hope will have other people uh, understand the rationale behind your recommendation. So thank you very much. Yeah, that's a great point, uh, board member uh, Ojeda, Thorne Ojeda. I think last year uh, when we were, we saw these uh, numbers, we saw these numbers last year, we were really uh, worried. Uh, so the the guidelines were changed. Last year, we would not even be able to come back if we were below seven. So that changed uh, in December. 
So uh, where the governor uh, now is uh, changed it to 25 per 100,000. So I think that's a great point. Uh, last year, again, when we were looking at these numbers, uh, we were really worried about uh, the positivity rates and, and, and people getting infected and, and we still are. So it's still widespread. That hasn't changed uh, in, in our perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions from board members? I had a question. Please, board member okay. Um Yeah, this is, this is uh, Bert Radigan. Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Superintendent Miranda, for the explanation, for the thorough explanation, for letting us know where you uh, went for resources, and also for your data analysis, very, very thorough. This explains, you know, it, it explains the decisions um, much, it makes it made more clear for all of us. Um, the, I had a question regarding the safety plan that is that we are going to submit. I think it's called the COVID-19 safety plan. Um, once we submit it uh, to the Safe Schools for All team, what is the next step? Do we wait for their approval or, or what, what's the next step with that? Uh, so thank you, Ms. again for the question. The COVID safety plan, um, that uh, the only, it has to, be submitted to the county for approval. So that goes to our county, the San Marino County of Schools. Uh, and the COVID safety plan is only required if the, if uh, we re are returning to schools this year. So it's not it's not a, a, a requirement unless we make a decision to come back this year. But we are being proactive. We're preparing the plan uh, because we feel that it, we, we should uh, have it ready, uh, and so we'll continue to proceed with the plan. But that plan goes to the uh, county superintendent of schools. In fact, uh, Mickey Inbody is the person responsible for uh, uh, looking at it, and then the county uh, will provide feedback on that. So, uh, so after we submit, they'll provide us feedback, and and again, it's only uh, required if we plan on coming back. But we're going to prepare it anyways. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Other questions and comments from board members? Board, board President Flores, this is Pat Haro. May I ask a question or a comment? Please, absolutely. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Miranda, um, my question is a couple of things. Uh, thank you for your part of the presentation. My question is, um, we had a board member meeting last week last Thursday, and board member Adeguin and then all of us agreed that we needed to have this special board meeting to discuss how we were going to proceed because we have spring break coming up and we need to make a decision. This presentation that you are all giving us this evening, was this presentation done before last Thursday's meeting? Was it put together no. before last Thursday's meeting? Absolutely not. Okay. I, I, and I, I figured, I know you were directed by the board, all of us, um, after Ms. Aragin brought it up and we all agreed that this had to happen and we agreed to have uh, a meeting immediately to discuss this and make a decision. Um, I, I, want, I want to say thank, I know um, as a board, we receive the board ag the agenda when it is available to go to the public and we receive it ahead of time to review the slides that we're going to see which are quite lengthy but i appreciate that because it's detailed and we also are able to ask some questions if we choose to at that time or ask them now we are also given uh, the opportunity to um, look at any background information that may help us with a decision. That being said, um, we have, as a board, we are listening to this presentation, and I understand that um, if you uh, are a parent or anyone else, it does say action item 4.1 says to approve to remain in distance learning through June 4th, 2021. That does not mean that we have already made 
that decision, correct? Yes. Okay. That is there because as a board, if we decide to go either way, if we were to open or not open, that is there because there has to be an action item on the board to make any kind of decision tonight, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. All right. I just wanted to clarify it. I wanted just to clarify that. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Uh, I, I just needed to clarify that because um, there is um, a lot of talk being said that um, that this presentation was already done and we and we've already made a decision to return to not return because of that action item which and i wanted to clarify it so so that members of the public understand that is not the situation when we are done with this presentation when we are done hearing all of the information we will discuss and ask questions and make a decision that does not mean that we have to approve or that action item so the the district gives us the information so that we can make an informed decision and i just wanted that to be understood so i thank you dr miranda and ahead of time i want to say thank you to all of the staff who have put forward this information because it is very lengthy but it's also a very very important topic that we have to have as much information as possible to make this decision. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification, Board Member Haro. And again, that's a good point. We may have folks that are listening to the meeting, maybe their first meeting. Just uh, again, to, to further clarify, um, staff's responsibility, their obligation is to put forth recommendations to the board. But let me be clear, as Board President and as many uh, many of you who've served on this board for a number of years know there is no action taken until this board gets together in the duly noticed meeting, deliberates, and then votes uh, to determine the direction of the district. So the, what is on the agenda tonight is not a predetermined outcome by any stretch. It is a recommendation from staff. That is their job to offer recommendations. It is our job as members of this Board of Education to take that information in, take the information in from public comment and other sources as well as deliberate with one another and then ultimately we'll make a decision. It's no different than bringing forth an item uh, that says recommend purchase of uh, Chromebooks or purchase buses for schools. Those are affirmative recommendations from the staff, but they require us to make the final decision. So uh, for those maybe a little confused about that item and how it's presented, it is a recommendation from staff and we'll, we'll obviously talk more about that when we get to that item. We're still in the presentation phase, but Board Member Haro, uh, I thank you for that because I, I did get a couple of questions about that myself uh, as to what that meant when it was placed on the agenda. So it's important to clarify that. Uh, other questions, comments from, from board members on the initial um, portion of this presentation? From Dr. I have a comment. This is Chris. Please, please, Mr. Barr. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank uh, Dr. Miranda for his thorough uh, a report on uh, the current uh, situation here at Cone uh, Joint Unified School District. I think it was important for him to go over these areas so that uh, we and the public are aware of where our status is at this particular point in time. Uh, because of so many other districts uh, uh, in our state and other states who are making the move to open, I think it oftentimes can confuse individuals thinking that, you know, it, you know, it's time to open for everyone. And I think that as you take a look at the numbers, uh, the status, and uh, where we're at, it, it's, it's a clear indicator at this particular point in time that though we are moving in the right direction and we continue to be, need to be vigilant in, in uh, doing all the, the PPE uh, protocols that we're required to do, uh, we still are not in that particular area of uh, that we can open at this particular point in time. And I just want to thank Dr. Miranda for bringing uh, those issues to our attention. Uh, one of the things that I've been noting uh, for the last 
several months is the fact that we needed to continue our uh, work on communication. And I think it's going to be even more evident in this particular point in time in this phase of us moving forward in the school year and for the next school year. And uh, the question I have for uh, Dr. Miranda at this point is uh, uh, what efforts are we as a district going to do in order to communicate the direction of what we need our staff, our teachers, our classified uh, personnel to prepare for as we move forward toward the next school year um, and if uh, and are we going to be required to uh, provide additional training to our teachers um, uh, regarding uh, protocol uh, dealing with uh, uh, issues relative to uh, the PPE and and of course what is going to be our uh, our support going to be like for each site. Can you uh, talk a little bit on that for us, uh, Dr. Miranda? Uh, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ibarra. And uh, that's a great point in terms of the communication and messaging that we have to put out there. So we've spent a, a lot of time talking about what that looks like. Uh, just to give you an idea, so, uh, and, and I'm going to show you a timeline at the end that exactly is going to address that. Uh, we have uh, trainings planned for our community. In fact, those were uh, are planned out so we can get the uh, word out what our schools are going to look like, what should they expect in terms when they when students do come back in terms of procedures, because there's going to be some changes to that. Obviously, so we also are going to include uh, uh, trainings for our teachers uh, and certainly get the get the information out. Starting next week, uh, because we need to start with our site principals, our administrators at the sites, we're going to have weekly meetings with them regards to uh, reopening. Regardless of whatever the decision is, uh, that's not going to stop. And so you're going to see uh, in over the next uh, couple of weeks an increase in communication about reopening. Uh, and so uh, we have a uh, a timeline that I'll share at the very end, and, and I promise you that, and you'll see that, uh, so that uh, we, we're ready. So in other words, we are not stopping the preparation and the communication that goes out there, because it's gonna be really important to get this out. Uh, in, on March 10th, and then just a shout out, since uh, you've asked at our community cabinet, uh, we are going to be talking about uh, the reopening with our community cabinet members. And so that will be posted online. Uh, in fact, uh, we were going to we're going to be talking about uh, again the uh, the reopening and providing a state of the district update to all our stakeholders at the March 10th community cabinet in in a couple of weeks. So uh, so those are some of the things uh, that that we have planned at this point. And I certainly at the end again uh, second to the last slide you'll see the timeline that I'll readdress that. Uh, in the trainings for the community. Okay, uh, Dr. Miranda, would the timeline also include uh, uh, the preparation for our facilities, uh, well, making sure that they're all prepared to take in students and staff? Uh, or do you have a timeline for that as well where you can we can say 100% of our facilities are, are ready to go? Oh, that that's correct. The timeline addresses that, and then Rick and his in his uh, in his section will address that piece too. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Great, thank you, Board Member Barrow. Uh, any other questions or comments before we go to the next section of today's presentation? Uh, I'll just uh, ask a question, just to clarify, Dr. Miranda. I appreciate the data with respect to the case rate, and this is kind of the standard, not kind of. This is the standard, I should say that the state is holding uh, counties to to allow them to reopen elementary only. Again, high schools, middle schools are off the table. It's not a decision for the board to make. The state has made it clear they will not allow that to happen while our case rates are at the threshold they're at. However, you, you made a good point. Just to clarify, the, there is the county-wide rate, which is somewhere around, is it around 14 or so per 100,000? That, that sounds, that's close to, yes. That's so it's about 14 per 100,000, it has to be below 25. 
And that is good for anybody, any school district within the county that can use that number. But our number for our district is uh, 21.7, correct? So obviously higher than that number. 20, yeah, that's right, 21.5. 21.5, sorry, 21.5. Um, the problem, as I see it seems with the, the countywide number is we have literally the largest geographical county in the continental United States, which means our number, this is a statistic, so simple statistics, uh, they can be skewed by outliers. Our, our number includes communities like Yermo and Nipton and Angeles Oaks and all parts of the county that go from here literally to the Arizona border. And so you have very remote communities that have very few, if any, cases um, in these remote outlying areas. And by nature, because we're using a statistical average, they're going to skew the number. So that number of 14 cases per 100,000 countywide, I'll be honest with you, it doesn't mean a whole lot when we're looking at our community that we serve here. It's clearly a different uh, number. And, and the one that has me the most concerned is Bloomington. This is an underserved community where families already um, are impacted by COVID, have difficulty, uh, have, have been impacted by unemployment, have difficulty with access to health care, and they are more than 10 points above that threshold of 25, 35, almost 36 cases per 100,000. And the risk that there could be in that community uh, alone, mind you, Montana is above 25, Bolton is barely under that 25 threshold, but it's right there. Uh, what was not on that list, Dr. Miranda, was Rialto. We have a small portion of Rialto, granted not a big portion, but Rialto, where Joe Baca Middle School is located in the city of Rialto. We have a portion of Rialto. Uh, just for the record, they're, according to the county's website, they're at 25.6. They don't meet the threshold either. Mm -hmm. right. the only, really, the only city that's well below that threshold in our entire district is the city of Grand Terrace, which is also our smallest community. Uh, in, in the district. So just I appreciate that perspective and I hope everyone keeps in mind that the numbers that are being thrown around by the state, by the county, by the CDC even, are, are, are not necessarily indicative of our community. So I think it's key that we hone in on the numbers and the data that affect our community because we have the data. So I appreciate, uh, appreciate you sharing that with us. Right. <clears throat> and board president, I just want to make a couple of points on that, because I think you bring up some excellent points, if I may, uh, to put in more perspective, uh, the numbers we're looking at today are actually higher than early November of 2020. And, uh, and then point number two that I'll make is since December, the, uh, the last board presentation on December, uh, I think it was the 12th, the state and local guidance has changed two times since then since December. Uh, and so we are, in a sense, chasing uh, a moving target, uh, which, uh, yeah, so, and planning for. Uh, so again, just to put in perspective, the numbers today are still higher than last November. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, and we have quite a few um, presenters tonight with respect to this, so we'll go ahead and that's our other uh, questions from board members. We'll go ahead and hand it off to our next presenter. Yep. Okay. Right. So, uh, right. Mr. Jensen, he will uh, he will be next. So, Rick. Thank you, Dr. Miranda, uh, President Flores, members of the board, executive cabinet, and our members of our virtual community. I am pleased to uh, discuss tonight the plans we are making and the preparations we're we're making to prepare our classrooms and sites for a safe return to school. Um, so first of all, uh, the COVID safety plan that has already been mentioned, and I know there's already been a question about this and how it is submitted and so forth. So I uh, thank you, Dr. Miranda, for for uh, for touching on some of those uh, some of those um, details about the plan. Uh, I'll give you a little bit more information that I know. Uh, number one, the the plan, the safety plan itself, is comprised of two pieces the COVID protection plan, which is a requirement of Cal OSHA, which was completed in early January. And of course, we're, we continue to update that plan as well with, as new guidance comes out. The second piece to that that we received mid-January was the COVID-19 school guidance checklist, 
So the checklist is designed to make sure that we touch on certain areas in the plan to make sure we're covering all our bases when it comes to uh, preparing our school sites and uh, in, in preparation for students to return in class uh, instruction. So while we are developing the, uh, the COVID safety plan, we're also required to consult with our labor group and our parent and community organizations. We have to give them the opportunity to review the plan and give feedback on it before we then submit it to our local uh, county health department and the Safe Schools for All team, which is at the state level, and then they get seven days to review and comment. But once we receive those comments and adjust our plan accordingly, we then resubmit to both agencies. They have seven more days to review and comment. Uh, if we do not hear back from them, then technically on the eighth day after resubmitting the plan, uh, then we're allowed to reopen school sites. Uh, and then uh, the district also must post the plan on the district's website five days prior to students returning. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So in preparation to uh, not only get the data that we need and the feedback necessary to prepare the COVID safety plan, we also want the necessary feedback and do the research that we need to in order to get our sites and classrooms ready. So uh, we put together what is called the, the site and classroom layout committee. And then we broke out that committee into a more specific classroom layout committee. Now the, the, the site and classroom layout committee is composed of mostly uh, business service directors that we started putting some ideas together of how to get the sites ready. But the classroom layout committee is a little bit more in depth and it includes, um, it has our uh, teachers represented, uh, classified principals and our members of the site layout committee. So we have about 36 people in that committee uh, whose sole purpose is to talk about the guidelines for setting up the classroom desks and disinfecting uh, between classes and our passing periods. Today, we had um, a fourth meeting as a uh, committee that focused solely on disinfecting classrooms and how we're going to do that between passing periods. And we left the meeting knowing that this is a very complicated subject and there are no easy answers to how we can do this effectively between a five minute passing period. So we continue those discussions and we'll continue to do so uh, at this time. Next slide, please. So uh, as part of the classroom layout committee, we wanted to show models of what the classrooms can look like using various uh, setups, using different types of desks using sled desks, using single desks, using uh, rectangular and round desk, uh, round tables, and how those could be set up. So uh, we enlisted the help of Blue Elementary, Luther Harris Middle, and Colton High Schools to set up as models for uh, showing how those would look. Um, uh, by the way, we have some background noise, and if we can uh, uh, mute our mics, please. Thank you. Uh, so once we have the guidelines that we're developing finalized for setting up the classrooms and we will distribute those to site administrators and also um, the maintenance and operations will work directly with principals and teachers to set up the classrooms. And if I could take just a minute or two, I'd like to show you some, uh, a couple of pictures of what this could look like. So if Shane, you could click on the link and this will take us to a 360 degree view of some of those classrooms. So uh, go ahead, Shane, pick one of those, uh, pick one, anyone. So this is an example of a classroom, most likely a, a kinder room that uses round tables. And we set this up to show how this would look using the desk shields to separate students at the same desk. Um, in order to accommodate more students at a desk, you see in the far table uh, on the left-hand side, 
that we uh, put three tables or chairs around that table and use the dust shields to create a space and barriers for three people. All right, thank you. Let's look at one more. Let's see if we can pick one that has a lot of uh, single desks in it or rectangular desks. <clears throat> Okay, so as you see this, uh, this picture turn around here, it spins around. This is at Ruth O'Harris Middle School, I believe. And you can tell by the types of desks that are in there, uh, this is a middle school. And we have the desk shield set up on every other desk. And then we are using the existing furniture to separate students from each other. So there's a blank desk with no shield. Nobody can sit in those desks. They will be identified as such so that nobody sits there. And then uh, we still need to talk about the disinfecting between class periods, how we would clean these spaces so that the next group of students coming in are in a safe uh, and healthy environment. Okay, so uh, we'll go ahead and go back to the slides, please. <clears throat> Give me just a second, Mr. Jensen. Oh, you got it. Take, take your time. By the way, I do thank uh, the principals, uh, Dr. Cervantes, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Aguilar Munoz, and also um, uh, Ms. Um, Murphy at these three school sites for working so closely with us and allowing us onto the campus and 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 uh, and they really did a great job. I, I I really appreciate how they worked well with their their teachers um, to get feedback and set up these sites. So really, it wasn't just a model of setting up the classrooms; it was a model for the process of what it would take to get these sites ready in that regard. Okay. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about what's going on uh, in the, I'm sorry, let me, let me move my slide. Okay, there we go. Now we're on the same page. So maintenance and operations and facilities department are major players when it comes to coming up with how we're going to uh, set up the classrooms. They've had a lot of great input and uh, we've had to look at so many different things, not just the setting up of, of desks and chairs, but also how we're going to uh, maintain the environment as a healthy environment. So we'll start off with uh, having deep cleaned all the classrooms starting with summer of last year. And uh, as we also, as we set up the classrooms for these three model sites, they did one more thorough cleaning before uh, finishing. Uh, we will do that for all school sites to make sure that they're uh, as clean as possible prior to students entering into the classrooms. Um, disinfecting, whenever there is a, a potential COVID-19 exposure in any classroom or office space, we are disinfecting those areas currently with a hydrostatic sprayer, as well as hitting all the high touch points within those rooms. And by the way, every, every night that we know there's somebody on campus, the uh, custodians do clean and sanitize all those high touch point areas according to CDC guidelines. Um, we also uh, are, have installed SNE guards in all of the schools and office areas. Uh, the MNO department has been uh, very key in designing and installing uh, what are what I would consider permanent in installations of the sneeze guards or barriers that are at the front offices of all school sites. Uh, we are mobilizing staff this week right now because now we uh, this week is the first week we've had MNO back three days a week to start going through all the school sites checking uh, the plumbing checking electric electrical and performing basically the uh, fit inspection that we do uh, that ha that is done once a year we're performing those type of inspections right now to make sure our sites are ready to go because they basically have been mothballed for the past few months we have completed the installation of a GPS bipolar ionization unit 
these are needlepoint units that sit within the HVAC system. These are the type that do not do not uh, create ozone. Uh, as you probably know, the older ionization units did create ozone, and that was a, a problem with people with uh, with lung conditions. So uh, these particular units are designed not to produce ozone. They're used in the, the west wing of the, uh, of the White House currently. So uh, that was a good uh, um, recommendation that, uh, that I had to be able to give the go ahead to put these in all of our HVAC units. And according to uh, Mr. Chang, our director of facilities, I understand that there were 2,000 HVAC units in the district and they're all upgraded, including the district offices and the site offices as well. We also have procedures uh, for the HVAC units besides changing out the filters on a regular basis, which by the way include filters that are, are considered MERV 7. We're not using MERV 13 as you may have heard about because they put uh, undue stress and overburden the HVAC units and uh, we didn't want to have to increase the maintenance schedule of those units, but instead the ionization units will work tandem with the MERV 7 filters because the ionization units um, sole purpose is to ionize the air, create a charge that attracts the allergens, including viruses and bacteria that are in the air, and even pollen, and they clump together into a larger size so that they are caught by the filter more effectively. Okay, plus we are setting the HVAC units to turn on two hours before class and they are, uh, they will cycle the air six times per hour. So we're, we're setting up the units to bring in 70% of fresh air uh, whenever it, it, it recirculates 30% but brings in 70% of fresh air. And so at six times per hour, it'll be um, clean air six times. That's what that means. Uh, we have installed the thermal temperature scanners at every entrance point of the, uh, of the main points of entry for, for students, but also for uh, the public and staff when they enter into offices. We have completed the installation of bottle filling stations because water fountains are not allowed to be turned on and the bubblers have to be uh, deactivated. So uh, we've instead placed bottle filling stations on these same fountains using the water source. So uh, also we will be, I'll, I'll state a little bit later on, but I'll tell you now, we're also providing water bottles for all staff and students for this purpose. We've completed the classroom setups at three schools as we mentioned, and we're uh, completing the site, up, the site uh, setup guidelines. And so we hope to get those out in the next week. Um, I want them as finalized as possible. We just finished up a meeting today, as I mentioned. So it's always the latest and greatest data that we're working with. And then uh, working with the risk management department and for providing safe paths of travel throughout the sites. And we will have labels prepared that will show direction and also uh, standing distance six feet apart where appropriate. Next slide, please. In a purchasing warehouse and print shop area, uh, as I just barely mentioned, we're printing, or we have printed the COVID-19 prevention posters, ground markers, and signage. We are sending out to every site a package of 25 signs. And as I visited sites, I see that the sites have placed these sites throughout the campus, which is great to see. We've also, I, I don't know if the number 100 is correct. I'm sure I'll be corrected by one of my staff but we, uh, a certain number of ground social distancing labels have been provided to the site and we will uh, work with the sites on placing those labels um, strategically throughout the site. Uh, we do have a stockpile of uh, personal protective equipment for staff and students that we've received not only from the state but also using the, the CARES Act funding from the federal government uh, for that purpose. We have delivered PPE and supplies to the sites and district offices, but, but we also keep a large uh, quantity on hand in our warehouses uh, and we will distribute them as needed. We have purchased and the state has also donated over 200 handheld touches thermometers, but I don't know if those are necessary given the fact that we do have the, uh, the walk-up style 
therm thermometers now that you can stand in front of and it will read your temperature for you. We've also purchased, uh, it says purchased and ordered. We actually have received 20,000 dust shields and uh, we have not distributed those to the sites except for the three sites uh, that we have set up. Uh, we wanna make sure that they are uh, protected and only go out to the sites as we need them. So they are kept in our, uh, locked up in our uh, warehouse so that once we need them, they will be distributed to our maintenance and operations crews uh, to set up. And then the uh, 25,000 water bottles we talked about with CJUSD CARES, our um, wellness phrase. Uh, next slide, please. In nutrition services, our current meal service at the time is uh, we're serving um, meals at 16 of our sites, and we have teams from all the sites serving at those 16 sites. The meal currently includes a breakfast and lunch for two days. We serve on Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, the proposed hybrid meal service for elementary school sites is a grab-and-go style for distance learning students. will be open one hour before school ends for those uh, distance learning students or families to drive up and pick those meals up. For the in-person learning students, we'll be open for one hour after the school day ends for them to grab their lunch and uh, eat it off campus. Uh, we currently do not allow students to eat on our campuses at this time. Uh, the limiting factor uh, for how we can do this is really uh, the number of staff hours will be needed uh, early in the day for meal preparation. And then every school site will have a slightly different bell schedule. So those are the type of things we have to consider when, when putting these meal service uh, schedules together. At the middle and high schools, we will be serving a breakfast and a hot lunch uh, to in-person learning students. And because if I understand correctly, and I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, middle and high schools are gonna be a longer day uh, where the elementaries may uh, end at uh, 1231 o'clock uh, the high schools, middle schools go longer, they will actually have a lunch period and they will eat on campus. Uh, breakfast and cold lunch will be served one hour before uh, the lunch period through the last lunch period for distance learning students for pickup at the curb. Next slide, please. This is my final slide. Um, transportation is has worked on the bus schedules. Uh, they have these uh, ready for the next year. Uh, so uh, Eric Richardson and his staff have also been working on uh, getting a, a new routing software program uh, called TransFinder out of a group of three or four programs that we looked at. Uh, this is a very promising program that will help us develop uh, routes, especially in the hybrid format uh, for returning to school next year. I think this would be very key. Uh, and then we will continue to work with Ed Services and the sites to develop uh, bell schedules for the routes because I'm sure this will be a much different year given the fact that we cannot carry all uh, 56 students on a bus. We'll probably be limited to half of that number. Um, fiscal and risk management is currently working with the uh, COVID response team nurses. We have a team of four nurses or uh, yeah, four nurses and uh, their and the in, and information technology is working together on potential exposure reports to the staff. Uh, they're working. We're also working with the the safety staff, facilities, and site administration to develop the safe pathways on campuses. Um, working with the divisions, departments, and sites for how we can spend the new elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund number two allocation. So we had one allocation last year, we are getting another allocation this year, which is under the new Coronavirus Response Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act that was signed by uh, President Trump December 27th of last year, which is approximately just under $25 million for uh, a wide variety of purposes we can use for getting ready for uh, getting the sites ready. So at this point, I will stop and to see if the board has any questions. Thank you, Mr. Jensen. Uh, questions, comments from the board, from Mr. Jensen. I 
Mr. Chairman? Mr. Blood. Go ahead. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Um, so it, it's my understanding, do we have, have we purchased all the equipment we need to prepare our classrooms at this point? Uh, there's no need, because uh, I know there's some districts that have, uh, have uh, trouble with back orders that, you know, that uh, they can't fill. Do we, are we in a good place as far as everything we need to make sure that our classrooms are ready? That's a, that's a great question. And to answer that question, I'm going to do it in a couple of different parts. One is the, the one-time need that we have. So let's say the desk shields, the water bottles, the HVAC units uh, that are, we are replacing as well. Uh, we're not only putting the ionization uh, units in, but we're also uh, replacing some older units. Uh, that's part of the plan. Um, so those are done. Uh, the, the water bottle filling stations, those are done. We've also, I didn't mention here, but uh, we also replaced some uh, water fountains with hand washing and bottle filling stations or a combination unit throughout some of the campuses. So where we can do that and where there's a drain and a water supply, we've done that. Um, uh, Mr. Chang is also looking at uh, hand washing stations that are portable but also we're going to install those uh, into a, a, a drain system and, and uh, dedicated water lines. So they won't be portable, be, they'll be stationary, but they won't have to be cleaned out like a normal portable unit would have to be. Um, and then the second part of the question is the ongoing supplies that we will need. And so even though we do have uh, in-stock inventories of PPE, that means gloves and masks, disinfectant and so forth. We're good to go on that. We have our hydro hydrostatic sprayers. We have trained our people to use those items. Um, and it's just a matter of then, uh, we're holding on to them until people come back. They are in stock. We will then distribute them uh, before people return. And we'll also have, to, we have a way of replenishing uh, based on the need at the sites, uh, the, the, those uh, usable items. So um, I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. And um, you know, and, and we've had our, our maintenance uh, department, um, you know, also for their safety, not working five days a week. And starting next next uh, week, they are working five days a week. So I am thinking they're <laughs> going to come and they're going to hit the ground running uh, to making making sure that these desktops. The, the desk shields are, are in place. Is, is there a, a plan already in place as far as priority areas uh, where you will begin? Oh, excellent. Uh, I appreciate your question because it allows me to talk about it, uh, these plans that I didn't really cover in the uh, presentation. So um, as, you, as you stated, m &O, we've been, well, all of our staff, uh, those who can work on site have basically been limited to one or two days a week uh, for their safety. Um, those who can work from home, work from home. Uh, and they come in one day a week. Our sites have been open one day a week. Uh, we've made sure that there's been a custodian on site every day at our school sites just to make sure that things are okay. Um, and so we don't have night crews at this time. They're working during the days to fill that role. Uh, but now we're moving to five days. Uh, I believe, and I have to check with Adriana, that uh, we have notified our staff that they will be returning to normal schedules. But also, we want to um, take this opportunity, I mentioned in, in my uh, M&O slide, to go through and double check that all of our facilities and all of our um, uh, utilities are working appropriately. Uh, we're, 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 we're like taking a battleship out of mothballs. It does take some time. <laughs> And we want to make sure that uh, everything is good working order. So, um, in in fact, if uh, if if you were to tell me that April and and I'm not saying that this is what I'm I'm telling you to do, but if you told me April fifth was the day we're going to open, I we will make sure that we're ready to have desks in place and everything. The only thing that's been holding us back is the guidelines keep changing, as you know, and we're trying to hit that moving target. We do have our COVID safety plan nearly ready 
to submit, but the guidelines for the, uh, the classroom setup committee that we've been talking uh, for the past month or two, um, those are guidelines I want to be able to deliver to the school site so they know what we're expecting them to do to set up the school sites. And it's not on all, all of their shoulders either. Uh, we uh, are going to provide the, the manpower and the women power to set up those desks and put up the desk shields and clean uh, the classrooms thoroughly before anybody gets into those classrooms to use them for in-person teaching. So um, there, there is a process. We're trying to be very safe and methodical about it. We're trying to get feedback from our stakeholders to make sure we're taking everything into consideration because I'll tell you, if this were up to Rick Jensen to do on my own and, and what I know, uh, this is my first pandemic. I've never been through this before. I've never had to set up classrooms before. I am the wrong person to set up classrooms, I'll tell you that. So that's why we have our teachers, our principals, our classified staff involved in the process. Uh, Rick, uh, if you allow me just really quick to make this point, I think it's important that back in October, we brought a plan to bring back our employees, our, our employees to five days, and uh, we brought it to the board. And then our, our numbers, our COVID numbers hit 190. And so we decided to shut down uh, to one day. And that happened in December, if you remember, uh, that's when uh, we presented. I mean, we hit as high as 190. We worked with our unions, uh, with uh, Mr. Pacheco and CSCA to uh, ensure their safety. And so now we're, uh, our strategy, as Rick mentioned, is to bring them back uh, methodically and safely. Uh, and so I just want to make it very clear that uh, the idea that our schools will, will are not going to be ready, that, that is not accurate. Uh, our teams are working uh, diligently to get the sites ready. We have what we need. We have a plan. Uh, and uh, so that, I made that very clear. Uh, are, are we uh, ready to open today? Not at all our sites, uh, but we don't have all our employees back. And, but they're coming back. And, and, but we're being very cautious when we do bring back our employees. It's been a priority uh, since, uh, but again, in context, our numbers hit 190 uh, back in December. Those are extremely high numbers. Yes, and I, I really appreciate, you know, that that we we did consider every employee, you know, our, you know, our maintenance and operations uh, department, uh, you know, um, they are out there, um, you know, that is very important for us. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Mr. Flores, I have a question. Please, go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Rick, for your information. It's almost mind-boggling to consider um, all the things that you've had to look at. Uh, we don't think about those things, uh, and it's amazing the things you've, you've covered and all the progress you've made. A few questions I have. When you showed us the slide with students, three at a desk, um, of course, there's not six feet. So those plastic partitions remove the six foot requirement, I'm assuming. When, and I know this sounds maybe trite, but because I spent so much time dealing with issues with students and parents and teachers, all this information and all the big changes will be sent out somehow uh, reminding parents that students won't have the freedom in their classroom to go from place to place. Um, and with, if they're in a situation that is small like that, they need to stay within those, that particular small area, correct? So that's a, that's a good question. And I'd like to address both parts of, of your comments as well, because um, it is interesting to know uh, when we visited the, the three schools, they were able to meet the six foot distance requirement between students because they're either alternating desks or um, using the desk for spacing. And in, uh, in all cases, they were six feet apart. Now the guidelines do say no closer than four feet. So there is a minimum uh, we have to be above. So no less than four, but the, the, the optimum is six feet. Now the required distance that the six feet distance is a requirement between teacher and student. 
So um, I don't know how there's a physical distance that you can really do. <laughs> uh, I think it, it may have, I, I've seen uh, comments about how in the world can you, uh, can a teacher really be sitting over a student looking at their work uh, in this environment? It's going to be extremely difficult. And yes. other than putting them in a hazmat suit, um, it, it's, it's just doing everything we can. It's, it, the guidelines are guidelines, and, and really we, we can only meet those requirements as we can feasibly do it. So um, teachers will be wearing masks, students will be wearing masks. Uh, they, they have also face shields available if they so choose in conjunction with the mask. Um, so um, there are movable partitions, if they so choose, that we have available for purchase, uh, which we will purchase if they, if they would like to have those in the classroom. Again, a lot of this will be um, local control. We'll, we'll tell the sites what's available. They can decide on what's best for them, whether they put a sneeze guard on the desk for the teacher, whether they have a movable uh, transparent partition, um, whether they uh, just keep six foot distances around the perimeter of the of the uh, classroom, um, you know that that's something that we want them to uh, be comfortable with and make that decision. So. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> another issue that I have, and I think about um, what you talked about and the need for the constant cleaning with between class periods and whatnot. I know right now we have teams that go in to schools at different times. Have we considered um, the effectiveness of having like morning and night custodian assigned to schools now since there are so many things that have to be considered that weren't before? Is that something that would be more efficient? Or I, I'm, I'm just curious to see if that's been addressed. Uh, yeah, the team cleaning concept, as you know, um, and as I understand, uh, because I wasn't there at the time, was put in place because of the, the, the district was entering into a difficult financial time during the Great Recession. And in conjunction with our consultants at Hanover, uh, looking at different models from CASBO and ASBO um, and Florida, uh, they have their own guidelines that we also use. Uh, we had determined that the best way to uh, meet the needs of the classrooms, but also on a reduced staffing level, was to use the night teams. And so we, we continue to use the night teams at this time. Uh, have we talked about it? Certainly. Um, we, we're trying to figure out what is the best way to not only clean and disinfect the classrooms at, in the evening before students come in the, ne the next day, but also how can we keep classrooms clean throughout the day? Those are challenges that we face. And okay. so we're not gonna be able to do it with the, the staffing we have because um, there's just too much to do uh, at the same time. So uh, we will look at different options utilizing the, uh, the new ESSER two funds that I mentioned in the last slide. Um, those funds can be used for temporary positions during this uh, very difficult and unprecedented challenging time to try to keep our classrooms clean uh, during school day. So we're, we're looking at all options that we can consider. Another concern I have is um, storage. We have, there'll be a lot of equipment or a lot of material desks that won't be able to be used in classrooms right now. Or do we have places within each school that the excess can go to? Or are they going to be along the walls of the classrooms? And um, what about teachers who have a lot of materials and they can't be, you know, they can't be using that. For, you know, kids can't share materials now. What what provisions have been made for those kinds of things to keep the classrooms as clean as possible? Well, uh, the sites are coming up with some of their own ideas that we saw in the model classrooms. Uh, one is um, in case we have to go through and uh, disinfect with the hydrostatic sprayer, you know, if we are spraying papers, they will curl. Uh, they, will, they will not uh, survive a spraying. So especially classroom libraries. So uh, the, the sites have put um, coverings over those areas to protect them. 
Also, uh, think about shared materials such as classroom library books. Um, procedures, because you cannot disinfect a book, um, procedures would be in place to um, have, have those books uh, sit the required amount of time before a student could touch it again. Because the virus does not survive more than five days, uh, actually more than three days, after five days, they could put those back on the shelf. And it's just an option. Now, if we choose not to uh, allow that, uh, allow classroom libraries, that can be a site uh, decision if they think they can do it safely following the guidelines. So we are actually including guidelines for uh, how to uh, handle manipulatives and classroom libraries in, uh, in that regard. Um, also, because of uh, the storage needs at all the sites, um, it, it would be, in my opinion, using money to buy storage when it should be used in the classrooms uh, to try to get them prepared. I want to use that money as efficiently as possible. Um, we're trying as much as possible to utilize the existing furniture to provide space between students. And in the pictures you saw, um, and those are just a few, uh, that's actually working out pretty well. It was a theory in the beginning, but when they put it into practice, it actually looks like it's going to work. Um, so it, it does, uh, there will be some spaces where maybe uh, flexible furniture is being used and uh, the, the, the sites decide that they would like to put desks in there. They can then take uh, the extra desk from another classroom and create that space with the furniture from that other classroom. So those are options we're also putting into our guidelines. Um, so we're trying to think of everything that we can that they can set up the classrooms. Uh, it's, it's a, it is a daunting task, that's for sure. <laughs> we're trying to think of all the different scenarios. Thank you. Uh, the next thing I wanted to address was, uh, actually a thank you, shout out to you and to Owen about looking into the ionization units. Um, yeah, I, ozone was the issue with my unit. When I heard that, it was like, that's it. <laughs> um, so I'm excited about this one. And I hope that once this pandemic is over, that we will continue to utilize and these units and keep them up and running because that's going to create such a much healthier environment for kids who have le you know, um, lung and, and um, respiratory issues. So thank you for doing that, looking into that and let's keep it going. Um, two other things. One, and this sounds again um, picky, but with the water bottles, I know every principal out there is thinking, oh my God, how are we going to, we need to make sure we're giving them enough permanent markers to be able to mark those water bottles and some adult write their names on them so that they don't come undone because otherwise kids are going to be fighting over bottles. We're going to have parents saying we got contaminated from another child and that, I mean, it sounds like a small thing, but it can be a huge problem for the principals and teachers. So I'd like to make sure we have, we give them what they need to, to mark those for kids and make sure an adult does it. And the last thing I have is at the elementary level, there's no eating on campus. So my, my question is, should we return for any time this school year? and the children are doing testing at school. It's always been a big issue to make sure children eat breakfast prior to taking any state tests. So knowing that they are not going to be allowed to eat on campus, we may have children coming to school who have not been provided anything to eat before they take their tests, correct? Um, if we are uh, following the current model, we, we would, uh, what we're trying to prepare for the return of schools. In fact, uh, uh, I think it was in the previous slide that we're looking at. Um, we're, we have plans in place to provide both breakfast and lunch at the school site, not just lunch. So uh, we would make sure that even as we do right now, we're providing two breakfasts and two lunch on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, but it would be Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday, Friday and in the hybrid model. So they would be able to have something to eat at school before a test. Yes, that is my understanding. Okay, I thought I heard that it, they weren't going to be allowed to be eat, eating at school at the elementary level. Yeah, I, I did say that, but they would get, um, when they pick up their, at the elementary level, 
when they pick up their grab and go, it will have breakfast for the next morning. Already. And and lunch for oh, the next. I see. Yeah. So parents are going to be responsible for making sure the child eats that before he goes to school in the morning. Just as they do now. Right. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. That was really good information. Oh, and if I could just touch on the bottle thing. Um, we did ensure that the bottles have a place for the student to write their name. So, like you said, we'll need to make sure there's, you know, permanent markers or, uh, you know, they're getting those names on those so that they don't cross contaminate. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that. Any other questions for Mr. Jensen? More President Flores, I have a question. This is Pat Hara. Yes, please. Board Member Hara. Um, Mr. Jensen, I think um, a question that a lot of people are wondering um, who are listening, because we have a lot of parents, we have a lot of staff who are listening <coughs> to this presentation. <coughs> Excuse me, I apologize. Um, we talked about, uh, you showed how the classrooms are going to look and all the different things that we've done and what we are doing. And um, my question is a lot of people uh, may say, um, you know, we've been off since last March, we've been off a year. What have we been doing? Okay, to get ready for this, to get ready to open. What have we been doing um, for a year? And I, as a board member, because we have our meetings and we have our board correspondence, I, we all understand all the preparations and things of why we are where we are and we're not like ready to open tomorrow. Um, can you give a little background to the public as to why we are where we are right now? Thank you. Oh, uh, thank you for the opportunity to address that question because I know that's on a lot of people's minds. Um, so, so does it, it does appear like we're all hands on deck right now, and maybe that maybe that is the case. Uh, as Dr. Miranda mentioned earlier, uh, the the environment in which our we're asking our our employees to work has not been conducive. It's not been. Uh, one in which we were comfortable bringing our staff in uh, every day, uh, especially our, our maintenance and operations staff. Um, they're the ones who are in the thick of it. You know, they're in the school sites. They're um, around everybody. Um, they are tasked with um, making sure that our facilities are in tip-top shape and you can't do that if they're at home. Uh, so that's why uh, we've been um, really watching the numbers closely and um, making plans for when they could come back. So during the past two or three months, and even though we, we had um, initially we were making plans back in September to, to come back in January, if you, if you recall, we we're looking at January comeback, and then the numbers skyrocketed. It, it just put everything on the back burner. So um, we've been working on uh, everything else that we can do besides the actual setup of the sites, which involves all the planning that you've seen here. For example, we can't drive buses right now, but that doesn't mean that we can't work on the bus routes and the bus plans and how we're gonna have students enter the buses and exit the buses and so forth, how many students we can have on a bus and keep them physically separate. Um, so that's just one example. But uh, we have been working for the past couple of months on, uh, first of all, addressing what the, the COVID safety plan is asking us to do, because that's new information It came out middle of January. So we're trying to do what we can during this time to address that, uh, along with uh, making sure that um, we're getting feedback from, from uh, the key individuals that uh, need to have a say in how that plan is developed. And that's why I put the committees together uh, to address those uh, concerns so that when we do present that plan to parents and to our uh, community for review, that uh, they feel comfortable with what we've done. Now, it, our, I don't think we're, everybody's going to be 100% comfortable with how we are going to be able to come back uh, given what the coronavirus, uh, the level of the infection rate is. Um, as long as the, co the coronavirus is prevalent in the community, I think every, a lot of people are going to be reticent to return to classroom. I think that's just a natural, um, 
a natural fear of, uh, of, of being in that environment. But as the numbers come down and we drop into the red area and the orange area and, the, and, the, and finally the yellow, that um, I'm hoping that we'll, we'll be more and more uh, as, a, as a community, as parents, as, as students, as workers, that we all feel safe in coming back in that environment. So we're doing everything we possibly can to uh, try to mitigate the risk of catching the coronavirus in the workplace. But uh, as, as it has been shown, no matter how careful people are out in the environment, we can't control, we can control what they do at work, we can't control what happens outside of work, you know? So, uh, and that's what we're dealing with right now is uh, we're coming off of a, a very large surge and we've had to put plans on the back burner uh, to get classrooms physically ready. But now that things are opening back up and as, as you uh, heard tonight, uh, our MNO staff back three days a week this week and in uh, next week or so, we'll have them back on the first of the month, uh, uh, five days a week. And they, they are excited to get working. Uh, honestly, they're sick and tired of sitting at home and they, they wanna get busy. And, and they're ex actually, when we told them that they were coming back, uh, some of them actually proclaimed, yay, let's go. We're ready to get this done. And I'm glad to hear that. Uh, we have a great crew. We have a, an excellent maintenance and operations staff. And I really want to uh, give kudos to them and say, um, you know, we, we're looking forward as, as a new, uh, new assistant superintendent over business services. I have not had the opportunity to meet everybody like I should. And I'm looking forward to that and working together with everybody and working together as a team to get our sites ready and helping our staff and students feel uh, comfortable in coming back to school eventually. Right, any other, um, any other questions from Mr. Jensen? All right. Thank you, Mr. Jensen, for that very informative presentation. Appreciate You're welcome. The Thank attention you. to detail that's required. Well, good evening, uh, Board President Flores, board members, um, Dr. Miranda, superintendent, and our community members. Um, on behalf of the Student Services Division, I get to um, highlight the health and safety protocols that are required and that will be in place. Um, in regards to a hybrid model um, in returning students and staff. <clears throat> and so face coverings, which include both disposable and cloth masks, have been purchased for all students and staff. Um, students and staff, of course, will have the option to wear their own. So these will be in addition to what they prefer, to, you know, what they already may have. All schools have developed plans to conduct health screenings of all, of, of all staff and students entering campus and district sites each day. All schools have identified a supervised isolation room, which is required to house students who may be ill, become ill, and exhibit COVID-19 symptoms during the school day. Contact tracking protocol has been developed and implemented um, following all the protocols um, that have been mandated by San Bernardino, San Bernardino Department of Health um, Department and Cal OSHA. All schools have, have, will have posters to promote healthy hygiene steps and mark proper social distancing in high traffic areas. Next slide, please. In conjunction with the, the earlier um, protocol um, notes that I've made, all schools have developed plans to, to control ingress and egress of staff and students each day. Um, increased supervision will be needed for, from a variety of eligible staff to remind students of physical distancing and to disperse large groups. Um, staff and secondary students will be required to wear their district issued employee student ID badges. And we have purchased lanyards and, and everything that, that is required to help them with that process. Mental health and social emotional supports will be in place. Um, and we are preparing and pretty much almost finalizing mental health training to help staff recognize when our students are in crisis prior to um, returning to this in-person variation of instruction. And so um, that is very important because students are going to be coming back and teachers need to be able to, to you know, seek out those cues and direct them to the right resources to receive help. Also, increased services for English learners, 504 students, IEP students, um, foster homeless and I promise students um, will be available once again 
because we're not using the virtual platform as our only um, entity to provide those services. Next slide. So I've, I've been very blessed to reach out to other counties and school districts to talk about um, some of their planning and, um, and some of their adventures in bringing students back um, in this hybrid model. And I really captured just the themes of what they've shared with me. And so in, in regards to the positive um, things that I captured, access to in-person resources for students, staff, and parents. As you know, we're doing a great job of, of, of rendering our, our resources and services virtually, but um, nothing compares to in-person um, um, resources or, or contact. Um, another thing they shared is increased services for EL 504, IEP students, foster homeless, and I promise students. Um, the other thing they, they talked about is being able to resume extracurricular activities of all, of all facets. Um, some of the challenges that were um, very much uh, consistent themes is coordinating services based on the A and B cohort model. Opening and closing schools due to COVID-19 exposure and outbreak. Um, starting and pausing extracurricular activities, including athletics, due to COVID-19 exposure um, and outbreak. And then providing all staff with the opportunity to receive the COVID-19 vaccine prior to return. Next slide, please. So we've been very patient and fortunate to, um, in working with the county and our local um, partners, medical partners, um, and Dignity Health um, has allotted 432 um, doses of the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and those appointments will have been issued and will take place on February 28th from 7 um, a.m. to 3 p.m. Um, also with Arrow, um, Arrowhead Regional Medical Center, they have um, just notified us that they have allocated 430 doses of the Pfizer um, vaccination, and those appointments will be available to staff um, on Monday, March 1st, from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. by appointment only. And so that's been a very tough and um, frustrating process, to be honest. And as we all know, there's, not, there's a, a very limited amount of uh, vaccine doses being distributed to each county. But once again, um, in fo focusing on the positive, um, it, we are very happy that we're able to afford this opportunity to our staff. And so, as you can see there, we have nearly 900 um, op you know, appointments available for staff to receive the vaccine in conjunction with um, the fact that there are a lot of um, other sources that um, our staff members have pursued to receive the vaccine. And I believe that concludes my portion of the presentation. And I'd like to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Day. I'll, I'll I have a quick question just since we're on the slide about vaccinations. Um, simple question: the vaccine, uh, well, the Pfizer vaccine, which is going to be administered, obviously is a two-dose vaccine. Uh, have our employees been assured? Have we been assured? I should say by both Dignity and ARMC that those who do participate in these. Um, Test, uh, these vaccination appointments will be uh, ensured, will be guaranteed that second dose within the appropriate time frame. Yes, they have reassured us. And the, the one thing about this slow but frustrating process is they've learned a lot. And so they have a, a, a better plan in place. Um, it, I'm sure we've heard through social media that there's been some complications with that, but um, our, our staff will be guaranteed that second appointment. And actually when they receive their first dose, they're going to schedule their second appointment at that particular time during that appointment. Great, thank you. And, and we have confirmed um, that we have appointments for all of those doses, correct? Yes, we did. Excellent. Yes. Not a single one will go to waste. Good. Yes. Uh, questions from board members for Mr. Day. I have a question. This is board member Fuentes. Please. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Brandon, a uh, question for you. On uh, talking on the vaccine, uh, is this for any age in our district? Just want to make sure. Yes. It, okay, so, for any age. great question for any age and for and it's for staff. I, there's been some rumors that people have called, and and when they call, they said you know they're being told that if they're not a teacher, they cannot receive the vaccine. That's not the case here. So it's any age and any staff member to go and join Unify. Will they be giving a card or something that just states that they have taken the? Uh, vaccine do you know if that's going to happen yes yes that is something uh, that card is something that's being given out by everyone um, um, especially because they're um, 
the projected travel it's situations that we may have. Um, so yes, they will be given that card after the conclusion of their second dose. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Dan, I have a question. Please. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Dade. Um, first of all, you used a term that I've never heard and I'd like to know what that means. What's the definition of an at promise student? Also, oh, at promise is a, it's basically um, a new term that's being used by the California Department of Education to replace at risk. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, my second, con uh, actually, kudos. I was very happy to hear that they were considering classified um, and other, you know, support workers in the vaccination opportunities. So thank you for whoever made sure that happened. The last one I have, um, I know when we've had employees on campus, if someone is exposed to COVID-19, we've had to notify them with the contact tracing and whatnot. And often if they're positive, they have to go home. What will the procedure be if we have a student come to school, he's sent home, he tested positive, what what happens then at the school level for the children in his or her classroom? Yes, yeah, so we'll still utilize the contact tracing protocols. Um, and let's say if it's a student in cohort A, um, the students that, that have had direct contact with that particular student um, will, will be asked to remain at home. Um, we will encourage and, and provide the opportunity for that student who may have been exposed um, to receive testing. Um, if the testing is uh, comes out positive, um, and then there, there will be a quarantine process for, for, the, for that particular cohort. If the testing um, comes out negative, then that student, all those students will be able to return to school um, very right away, basically immediately. And so, yes, we will continue to use the same protocols that we use for staff will be used for students. So if I'm understanding correctly, we have a student who comes to school, he tests positive, there's 13 children in his cohort, so those 13 children then have to be um, in quarantine for 10 days, is that? Yes, correct. Okay. Yes, so that, that's the protocol that's beyond us. That's what the County uh, Public Department of Health is asking. So yes, we will continue that, to practice that and follow those protocols. So in that case, then that teacher would go back to distance learning for that whole week or how, what would we do for, meeting the that, that is it's, it's a yes. great question so yes um ultimately um we would want to initiate distance learning again for those students um and you know you know heaven forbid that um the teacher is impacted or test positive and has some symptoms um that teacher will be asked to continue to provide the instructional service but if they are impacted and have symptoms that will not allow them to do so um, we'll have to put a, a substitute substitute teacher in place. And it could be during our testing period. Yes. Coming up. Yeah. Yep. Yes. And I guess this is more of an instructional question, but if we don't test all of our children with the entire test, then we're penalized for that, I believe. That that's a curriculum question. Thank you very much. I appreciated the information. Thank you for your questions. Other questions for board members? I just wanted to say thank you to the staff for pursuing the vaccination partnership. This is huge and I really, really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, board member Flores, this is Pat Harrell. Yes. Um, I too, I want to reiterate <clears throat> what <clears throat> board member Aragin just said. Um, uh, when we found out that the uh, vaccines had been that we were promising our our teachers the 500 teachers or whatever that we were able to get them for originally um i was quite vocal about my displeasure with the county for choosing to pick private schools over public schools to get those vaccines so i'm very proud of the district for continuing for our board and for our district to continue to fight for these doses that we got for um, our teachers and all of our staff. So I just wanna reiterate, uh, thank you 
to our district for continuing to fight for that. Thank you for that, Board Member Haro. And yes, thank you for being persistent um, because this is a key to helping uh, really tackle that. We have vaccines that are out there on the market, quite frankly, that are 98% effective. And we could just, the more that we inoculate, um, the sooner we'll get out of the pandemic here. Along those lines, one follow-up question. We, we have had a number of teachers and staff who on their own have sought uh, vaccinations, uh, whether it's there, they reside in another county, such as Riverside County, that I think started a little sooner than San Diego County inoculating teachers, or Loma Linda University Medical Center, who's been very proactive and in, in inviting teachers to come. Is there a way to survey or identify how many of our staff may have already received that vaccine, at least the first dose? Because um, we would add that to this number and have a better sense of what percentage of our total staff have received the vaccine. I got I have to imagine that may be a, a fairly substantial number given how proactive people have been. Yeah, we can uh, definitely a great question. We can we can pursue that information, but because of HIPAA laws, um, uh, staff can choose to disclose or not disclose that. Um, so really, um, it would be tough for us to to seek that out. But um, yeah. but I agree with you. There have been a lot of staff members who have sought other um, avenues to receive the vaccine and, and I get, we get we're getting a lot of thank you messages and and um, for our support and guiding them to those different entities so I would say it's a pretty high number uh, but yeah to, to ask staff directly it would be kind of a, up to them to disclose that information right and I just certainly want to protect HIPAA but if there's a way we can sort of get voluntary aggregate data where we don't need any personal information really just if you have, if you can indicate to some extent, so we have an idea of how many folks have uh, been yeah. vaccinated. I think most folks will probably be happy to be proactive in sharing that. Yeah. So and yes, Brandon, uh, maybe if, if my, uh, this is Mr. Uh, board member Fuentes, I think maybe an anonymous survey would probably work mm -hmm. uh, to, for that. I, I'd love to see what the uh, numbers are. If there's a way to do that, uh, that would be great. Thank you. Absolutely. So we'll definitely look into that. Um, thank you for that suggestion. We'll look into that and get back to everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right. Um, representation. Uh, we'll go ahead then. If, unless there are any other questions, we can proceed to the next seg next segment of our presentation. Uh, Dan, I have a quick question. Sure, please. For Member Bar. Yes. Just for our knowledge, um, how were the, our staff notified about these appointments? Uh, through the district, how did the district notify them that these were available, Mr. Day? Great question. Thank you so much. Um, so we utilize a, a kind of a two-pronged pro approach. So we e use the district emails, um, sent out multiple emails, and use a Google survey to capture um, the interest of, of staff who wanted to pursue um, receiving the vaccine. And then throughout our divisions and departments, um, the leaders in those areas. Um, also verbalize that the information to staff to, to make sure to check their emails and to pursue the opportunity if they were interested. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, just a quick thought. Uh, I've heard uh, from others and other districts. Came the shot similar to the TB tuberculosis. Uh, have you heard anything to that effect? Yes, there has definitely been some um, some rumbling um, about that. Or I should say because social media is a little bit of a, it's more about rumbling. So we are patiently waiting for for the directive to come to us. Um, but um, nothing I've I've not seen any document as of yet. Okay, thank you. Just curious. Appreciate it and a great report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dave, uh, for that presentation. And we'll go ahead and go to the next uh, segment of our presentation. I believe that's education services. So we will turn it over to Dr. Peterson. That would be me. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, Board President Flores, board members, Superintendent Miranda, and members of the community. Um, I will take the next few minutes to discuss the hybrid return as it relates to academics. And so what's shown here are the educational options. We're under this school year. Approximately 80 to 85 percent of our students are in the distance learning hybrid model. The remaining students are in full-time distance learning in TK through sixth grade and facilitated online learning in grades seven through 12. And then, of course, um, our Washington Independent Study and Home Choice is at Washington High School. 
and these will continue through the end of the school year. Um, the proposed hybrid 50-50 model, which still needs to be negotiated, so um, any questions regarding like specific schedules or things like that, uh, we don't have answers to yet um, until those negotiations take place. Um, I can speak from, you know, we've kind of in the past put what it could look like, and so I can speak from that from that standpoint. And so um, the proposed model is set up so that students, they are tagged in two cohorts A and B, and we go to school in person two days a week, spend one day in distance learning instruction, and the other two days with asynchronous instruction with a minimum of a teacher check-in. Uh, next slide, please. In anticipation of returning to school at the beginning of the school year, all students were scheduled into their courses as either A or is either part of it, cohort A or part of cohort B. Students were scheduled geographically to provide an equitable distribution in each area. If we transition to hybrid, we do expect that there will be many requests for schedule changes from distance learning to hybrid and to full, from full-time distance learning to hybrid, as well as from hybrid to full-time distance learning. Once decided, curriculum teams will meet if necessary to determine the pacing for the time remaining in the school year. And then of course, district curriculum program specialists and site TOAs will continue to support teachers with their professional development needs in either um, category. Next slide, please. Currently, the federal government is still requiring the states to test students. Therefore, the states are still requiring the district to test. Um, the State Board of Education actually met today uh, to de determine whether the state was going to waive testing for this year. Um, they did not waive testing for the school year. Um, and so we know LPAC testing, which is for English learner and learners and helps with re reclassification, uh, will be required and they are not seeking a waiver for, for that. Um, the other tests are our CAS tests for language, link, excuse me, link, English language arts and math, and our CAS test, which is for science. Um, the CAS test was canceled today by the State Board of Education um, due to the fact that it, it is not a federal requirement. Um, and then our alternate California alternate assessment for our special needs students. So sites have currently been trained in administering the tests online. So there is a concern that, that the hybrid schedule would result in an incons inconsistent testing environment. And as the board knows in December, middle school and high school online summer school was approved for June 7th to July 1st. And we want the board to know that we have an elementary committee that has been working on a plan that will be completed soon for elementary summer school, which we're calling summer camp, in which we hope we will include both an in-person and a distance learning option. We will be limited to the number of sites and students due to the costs associated with, with summer school as, as that is all 100% district funded and not based on attendance. Um, but we are targeting those students who are most in need of academic and social emotional support. We will also be coordinating with Think Together for our ACES summer enrichment program and are still working on what it will what that will look like with our with the ten elementary schools that are involved there. Next slide, please. Our current program for students for mitigation of learning loss and supports for students includes the diagnostic and assessments to identify student needs, and then of course addressing these needs using small group interventions and one on one support. Uh, we continue to monitor and support our EL students through elevation and with our EL TOAs, counselors, and curriculum program specialists. We continue to support our special education students, working with students and teachers through their I IEPs. Homework hotline continues this semester during the weeknights, and facilitated online learning is proving much more successful this semester as there's more support for our EL and special education students, and the tutoring offered through the program is built in, as well as, as well as tutoring being offered seven days a week um, for students to, to access. This semester, our middle school and high schools have added 11 different credit recovery classes, either after school, during the evenings, or on weekends, with additional courses being offered as part of the school day or extended day at high schools. This also could prove a disruption to these courses in a hybrid, in a return to hybrid model. Next slide, please. 
The academic considerations that should be known if we return in a hybrid schedule include the possibility of less, less instruction time with teachers. Um, currently, elementary students receive consistent instructional hours five days a week. A move to hybrid in some of the schedules we've been talking about would change this to three days instruction with asynchronous and check-ins on the other two days. In middle school and high school, students are currently receiving instruction in each period three days per week, and a move to hybrid would lower that to two days with the schedules that are being discussed. Having said that, we are looking into technology, which will allow for simultaneous instruction at home and in the classroom, uh, but more than likely not until next year. The change to hybrid will result in many schedule changes from those wanting to go from full-time distance learning and facilitated online learning to hybrid, and those wanting to go from hybrid to distance learning and facilitated online learning. This would require student class changes, teacher class changes, possible teacher moves uh, from one to the other, and possibly affect student credits. In a hybrid model, teachers will have to focus on both distance learning and hybrid instead of focusing solely on distance learning. Movement will cause a huge disrupt in the, disruption to testing for both teachers and students as they will need time to adjust to this transition in order to prepare their classrooms and then time to um, adjust with students as students return to, return to class, which may result in incompletion of required tests or running out of testing days in the small number of um, days we have during fourth quarter. Sites have begun the scheduling processes for next year, especially in secondary, where counselors are working with students to select courses for next year, and sites are planning their master schedules. A move to hybrid would result in the focus being placed back on the current schedule changes and focusing on, on the transition back to the schools and would place a hold on the preparations for next year. As mentioned, we are in the planning process for an in-person elementary summer school, which could also provide us a trial run for in-person hybrid instruction next year and allow us time for issues to be resolved on school sites and to see where changes are needed. Finally, current supports discussed earlier will continue regardless of choice, but these supports are being consistently implemented in distance learning and would not be disrupted at that, at that point. And so that is, uh, completes my presentation for educational services regarding our academics. May I answer any questions? Thank you, Dr. Peterson. Yes, a question from board member for Dr. Peterson. Board President Flores, this is Mrs. Harrell. Yes, please. Okay. Um, Ms. Peterson, uh, you said that today SBC, SBE um, canceled the CAST testing. Um, is there any chance that the CASP all these will be canceled. Will they follow suit and still cancel it? I just think this, I'm so against having our teachers having to do these tests this year and, and our students. I don't think this is going to help them. This is going to hinder them. And so is there any chance that it, it could still be canceled based on what happened today with the cast? So they have shortened, they have shortened the, uh, that just so you know, they have shortened the test um, this year um, extensively compared to last year. Um, as far as as um, still the, still the opportunity to cancel it, they meet again at the I believe that towards the end of March, and um, so there is a possibility at that point um, they could cancel at that point. Um, but there's a lot of a lot of uh, politics going on and a lot of organizations and, and a lot of different on both sides. Um, and um, we just don't know the likelihood of that. And we have to continue as if we're, we are going to be testing. Uh, when we put out the schedule as far as the remainder of the year and the days available to test, um, some of our sites will have to begin testing in March. Um, some of our secondary sites are beginning in March. And so um, for those, um, we will, if, if we don't get any information from the state in time, um, we will have to begin testing. Is there anything we as a district or what, um, when you say that there are people on both sides who are fighting for it or fighting against it, um, is there anything that we can do uh, 
to fight against it at this time or are or, 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 is the county fighting against it can you give me any other kind of information um i don't have specifics as to uh what counties are, are fighting that i'm sure we can um, contact our legislature um and the school and the state board of education and write um we can get email addresses and things like that to um write emails or provide our input uh, if i may uh uh miss harrell i think the, uh, that's an excellent uh question and point uh i have a meeting with um Alois Reyes, I uh, think all you know that she is now the majority leader. And so on Monday, we're going to be uh, talking about some other legislation she's asked me to be part of as a superintendent in the area. So I would certainly bring this up. Uh, Sandebs, as, uh, as you know, I'm part of that. Uh, so that has been, uh, that's coming up. So we're having a discussion on testing. And then uh, yesterday at our county meeting, uh, there was a lot of concerns about testing, so uh, I, and I certainly will take direction from the board. Uh, and and if uh, you know if you'd like me to take any other steps, uh, move forward. But I will still be advocating to these uh, to these folks about the concerns or 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 expressing my the concerns that we have as a district. Uh, if that's the the again, the direction. That, okay, I appreciate that, Dr. Miranda. I just feel that. You know, not just Colton teachers, but all teachers already are being asked to do so much. And our students are already being asked to do so much through distance learning and the struggles. I just think that this is ridiculous that that we're being asked to do that, th do this this year. So um, I guess uh, President Flores, I guess after everybody um, has their say in regards to um, our Ed Services presentation, if we could ask to see if we have a consensus to at least look into it, I would appreciate that. Certainly, and I, and I think that makes uh, makes a lot of sense given uh, the circumstances. So yeah, we can, we can ask for consensus after we wrap up other questions and comments. Are there other questions from board members for Dr. Peterson? I have one. Please, Dorian Ida. <clears throat> Uh, Dr. Peterson, when I was talking to Mr. Jensen, I asked a question that really was a curriculum instruction question. Uh, that being, if we have children in school and it's testing time and some children are gone because they've had to leave because a classmate was positive and they're in quarantine, um, what kind of penalty do we get if we don't have a high enough percentage of tests completed when they are submitted? So um, this year they have stated that there is no, um, they're going to take away. So in the past, if you're below the 95 percentile, they've taken away points on your overall scores. And so this year they've, they've said that they are not going to penalize our scores for that. Okay, and the second part maybe is a human resource question, but if we have substitutes, if we have to have substitutes for a period of time, I don't know what our sub pool looks like right now, but I would imagine it's much more difficult to um, find substitutes that are able to do distance learning than it was having them in person. Um, is that going to be a factor if we have kids in class with teachers not we don't not having enough substitute teachers to um, fulfill our need. Um, it it depends. You know that would depend on how many students and teachers were out. I think you know just as I said, the you know uh, teachers will probably need about two weeks in their classrooms to prepare or availability of their classrooms to pre prepare for students to come back. And then you're we're talking about. Um, you know, again, students are coming back for the first time this year. So, yeah, usually spend the first few weeks of school trying to um, instruct students on how to behave in class. And especially this year with uh, with uh, them coming back to new, basically a whole new whole new outlook with all with new rules. Um, there would be a lot of time spent on that. And so we talk about the disruption to the testing environment. If we come back in hybrid, that's 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 what I meant by that. 
with regard to yes, at, at that point we will run run the risk of uh, whether or not we actually can get everybody um, completed testing in time. They did extend the testing deadline to July July 30th, but once we go on on uh, once we get out in June, I don't know that July you know the July 30th or um, deadline actually helps us in that way. It would be such an enormous issue to do makeups because how how do you get those done? I, um, yeah, and if we're coming back and forth to in, at home and in school, and um, th we have trained teachers and, and we are trained to do the testing online, um, so there are parameters with with regard to that. And uh, if teachers haven't been trained, there they most certainly will be um, in the next next few weeks based off of, but it's all site, site leaders and site, um, site testing coordinators have all been trained, um, you know, they, for a while now in this area. And then just to keep track of which children have or haven't, uh, uh, just, it's a logistic nightmare. Yeah, uh, testing will be a logistical nightmare. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, I do appreciate all that you and the cabinet um, with Dr. Miranda have done in this report. We've got so many things to take into consideration. You know, and I think about children coming to school and they're, you know, they take this really seriously, the state testing, and to come back and be so nervous about that and getting used to that and that whole management piece for them and, I mean, for teachers with them and the stress of all that and then state testing it just it's mind-boggling to me yeah um, for our kids it's going to be such a stressful situation for them i i agree with mrs harrow if we could at least um send the message that we are totally against it because it's, it, it's not good for kids right now we're we're going through a pandemic we, they don't need more stress so i'm preaching to the choir i know but thank you for your information Thank you, Board Member Thorinaida. Other other questions from Board Members? Yes, I had a question uh, or a comment uh, regarding the, um, you know, the hybrid, um, you know, the implementation of hybrid. If we were to go with the hybrid, like, tomorrow or April 5th, when, you know, sometime within the year, um, the change, the class changes and teacher changes uh, is unavoidable, isn't it, uh, Dr. Peterson? I mean, there would have to be, like, for example, teacher, uh, uh, students may have a teacher throughout this whole year during distance learning, and move, switching to hybrid would, um, there would be a need to, um, a lot of movement. Uh, um, that seems yeah, unavoidable. and I think, I think what you heard in some of the comments tonight were parents saying they would switch their kids back from hybrid to distance learning. And so, um, yes, that would require a change in teachers. Um, that also would require at some point us pulling, you know, if we have to move teachers from the hybrid distance learning model to cover those changes, we're also moving those teachers away from the students that are staying in, in uh, the hybrid model. And so, um, um, yeah, the, the schedule changes will 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 create a, a lot of chaos um, to start off that that quarter, um, and then f with facilitated online learning and um, students at the secondary level going if they're going back and forth, um, you know you'll have a situation where a facilitated online online learning student has been using Ingenuity, and if they were to go back to the classroom. Um, they've missed all of what that teacher's been specifically teaching, even though they're taking a taking the similar class. They've missed the the in person or the online instruction with a teacher, specifically with a teacher all year, and so that can create issues there, as well as a, a student going from um, going from distance learning hybrid to the facilitated online learning. Um, you know, we would just, we would go through those courses and basically try to match up where they're at, um, a quarter's worth of work, uh, the second quarter worth of work, um, to have them finish. 
Okay. Yeah, I'm thinking just as, as an example, my granddaughter who was in first grade, she's been in with one teacher in distance learning all year. So this would mean that if we switch to hybrid, she would be basically maybe end up with a totally different teacher, different who she's been used to the whole year. And uh, she would have to get adjusted to a new teacher, new, new classmates and so forth. So that's something it's possible. That's yeah. Okay, and also um, the hybrid mo model, um, it does not mean that, that in the days that they're in school, that they will be in school all day, correct? That it'll only be three, four hours a day. So they would come from like eight to 12 and then you'd have to go home at noon. Again, again those, are, those are things we're negotiating. Um, okay. So I don't have a specific answer to that, but the models that we had thrown out earlier this year, most of the models we had talked about were um, elementary um, going through lunch or going to, going to about lunchtime and then um, secondary um, kind of a minimum day schedule as well where they would they would end end early as well okay thank you uh, dr peterson I, great questions um this out again actually i want to piggyback on one of your questions with respect to how uh, it could impact a student if they have to adjust or make a change to the schedule but here's kind of another interesting curveball um you know, I have three little ones that go to the same elementary school. So I've got a fourth grader, a second grader, and a kinder student. Now, in theory, if we went hybrid in April, um, we try to, I would assume you keep all, you try to keep all of my kids in the same cohort, either that Monday, Tuesday cohort or that Thursday, Friday. But depending on how many other families there are, and if everybody wanted their students, say, you know, the second grader to be in the cohort A, but it's, there's too many and we have to split it, we may have to move kids over, right? I mean, there, it, there's no guarantee that everybody that has, mul has, has a multiple children in, in elementary school are gonna have their kids on the same track, correct? We did our best at the beginning of the year to uh, account for that, but you are correct that I'm sure there's, there's, uh, there's probably several, several that either, whether it's, if they're in elementary, if you have elementary and then middle school and high school students, um, yes, they would be on different tracks, which could create childcare issues or concerns at that, that point. Um, but within, we, you know, within schools, we try to do our best um, to keep uh, families together um, in the same cohort um, as we started to a point of, yes, um, allowing, uh, allowing someone to come in and say, I want Thursday and Friday. Um, just for the sake of, I want Thursday and Friday would not would not happen. We'd have to say no. Um, if it was for an issue like that, where my son or daughter is in one grade is Monday, Tuesday, and another grade Thursday and Friday, we would try our best to accommodate accommodate that as much as possible. But you're right, we can't go over the limit of students. Um, at that point, you're talking about half a class, so you can't go over that number. In that case of elementary, it would be 12 to 15. Um, and so you can't go over those those numbers at that point. So yes, there could be some some uh, changes that we wouldn't be able to make. Okay, no, I appreciate that because I think there's practical implications here for families and impacts on families that could actually be more disruptive than the current rhythm. And trust me, I, I would much rather have my kids in school, but I'm just trying to think from the standpoint of if I have two that go Monday, Tuesday, they're all off on Wednesday, Mind you, two are on Monday, Tuesday. The third we're working with here at home. They're all home on Wednesday. And then the third goes Thursday, Friday. The other two are at home and we're working with them. It's, honestly, from our perspective, we're distance learning every five days a week. It doesn't actually alleviate our role as parents in helping facilitate distance learning. You know, it, we wouldn't alleviate the, the current stress, I'll say, of having to work with our kids from home except for those days when they're not in class we wouldn't have the teacher necessarily accessible to them to help them work through those things so anyway it's just so everybody kind of understands from a pragmatic standpoint the distance learning if we were to begin this year is far from a perfect solution it's not going back to regular school i think some folks thought what what, what the state was offering was we just open up the schools and start like regular school it's not it has to be a hybrid and it has to be split cohort so for anybody out there that has multiple children in the district at different grade levels, 
it could get very complicated very quickly. So I, I appreciate that. Um, and then the last question I have, Dr. Peterson, obviously you touched upon schedules matter. Uh, last day of the school year is June 4th. Um, there's normally, there's a lot going on right now with preparing for testing and then preparing for summer school and also preparing for next academic year. How would, if we said, okay, we, we need to prepare and flip the switch for start in early April for hybrid, what would that do to those other priorities that we're normally working on? And, and so, um, yeah, we would have to stop planning for next year, basically, at this point. Um, probably stop scheduling students for next year and work on the, the transition, um, work on that transition. And so, um, um, you know, we're, we're at a point, too, where, you know, we are trying to make decisions on the, what options we are going to offer next year as far as education because we're not out of uh, we're, we're probably not still still not going to be out of the pandemic and so we we still have to plan for um, different educational options last year and we can't do what we did this year as far as um, doing that in August that was just uh, or doing that in July um, out of necessity because we we just couldn't plan and so um, we're trying to do that now um, we have we, to the point of at some point in the next probably in April, having families select for next year even, that I want to, I want a, um, an online, um, an online option or a, or the hybrid um, full return option. Um, and so we're working on parameters for how we're going to do that. Um, we were, were going to have to, you know, survey teachers again um, before we get out this year to choose those options as well so that we can um, have master schedules and things ready um, when we return um, so we don't have uh, uh, kind of the chaotic start we had for uh, the first three weeks of school um, that we did this year. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Uh, unless there are any other uh, last questions for Dr. Peterson? We'll... I have one more, Ben. Oh, please. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Dr. Peterson, this is just a clarification for me. Um, when we would go to hybrid, whenever that occurs, the Chromebook that was that children use at home, that stays at home. That doesn't go back and forth each day, does it? It actually does. So, so as we discussed, as we as we kind of discussed earlier, you're going to see different things happening in the classroom as far as because even though teachers are back. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that that some of the, you know, if they want to, especially at the secondary level, if you want to do group work or things like that, um, there's that you could, a lot of, a lot of schools run it syn synchronously rather than, um, rather than a, a, just, a, just a check in, you know, some are able to have students that students participate and they're still using their computers while they're, while they're in class. So yes, we will have to bring, um, at this point, we're one-to-one -one with, with Chromebooks. And so um, from here on out, the, the goal would be that students bring their computers back and forth to school, um, but that, they, that um, over the course of the next year, and, or as we're, we're in this transition, that hopefully they won't have to bring their textbooks back and forth because the textbooks will be on, on the Chromebooks. Okay. Did I do I recall correctly that we said children are not to bring backpacks to school? Um, I think I, I don't remember and uh, Miss uh, Mr. Dade, maybe you can help with that. I think if they there has to be a place in the in the uh, I don't think we ever said that I think it ha there has to be a place in the classroom where they would where they would put their backpacks so that I, or so that other students wouldn't have them. So in an elementary classroom, you might have a, a cubby hole or a space for their students. That's just their stuff. Um, secondary is probably, they're probably a little bit easier to put them under their desks or things like that. But I don't believe we, we have not said that they can't bring their backpacks. Okay, I thought I heard that, but I was wondering how little ones are going to remember their Chromebook um, to, and from place to place that they don't use backpacks. So. Um, I'd like to just make sure we have some kind of procedure for that, if, if that is the case, because yeah. we're going to look at Chromebooks that way with little ones. 
I'm getting texts from my phone of friends that uh, that we haven't discussed that that yet. So that I, I actually appreciate you bringing that up. So it gives us something to to uh, that we haven't thought about to go back and plan for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. All right. Thank you, Dr. Peterson, for a very thorough uh, presentation. A lot to consider from an academic standpoint, and obviously the impacts rest on the shoulders of our, our teachers in many cases to try to make this work. Um, and so uh, we appreciate you sharing that. Uh, what would have to happen if we proceeded with a distance learning, excuse me, with um, a hybrid this year, and what would it look like going forward? Because obviously the goal is to get students back uh, as soon as it's safely possible. Um, we'll go ahead and transition to our next and I, and I believe final section of tonight's presentation. I believe this is going to be from our Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources, Mrs. Munsterman. Good evening, Mr. Flores, Board President Flores, Board uh, members, and Superintendent Miranda. Uh, on behalf of Human Resources, I'd like to bring some of the division highlights and then division challenges. Uh, Human Resources Division has been 100% functional throughout the pandemic. Uh, we've been working remotely Monday through Friday from 7.30 to 4.30. Um, we've been practicing protective personal equipment at all times, temperature checks at all times, wearing a mask and gloves, went on site, and disinfecting common areas, and we have one entrance and one exit. Next slide, please. Uh, we are continuing to post new and replacement positions in EdJoin. Uh, we held two virtual classified boot camps. Uh, we are conducting virtual interviews and pre-employment meetings. We have smaller testing sessions. We have six to nine applicants per session. Testing areas spaced at six feet apart. Temperatures taken before entering the computer lab. Test areas disinfected before and after each testing session, and face masks are worn at all times. Our ID badges, um, we have a new protocol for our ID badges. Appointments only, uh, new photo, uh, photos. Replace, uh, replacements can make be uh, mailed to employees at their home address if they want that. One entrance and one exit in that um, building also and we disinfect photo areas at all times. Next slide, please. Um, some of our division concerns. Uh, we are continuing with negotiation sessions. We're working on the hybrid MOU for certificated, any items that may arise from the agreement. We're working on a hybrid MOU for classified with any items that may arise from the agreement. Uh, we have a resolution on to how the school and sites will be kept cleaned and disinfected on a daily basis. This is also a possible MOU hiring additional staff. Uh, Mr. Jensen alluded to that earlier. We have small office spaces. Some desks are not six feet apart and ventilation systems are, um, um, we have some issues with our ventilation um, systems within the HR division. Substitute pool, both certificated and classified. Uh, we currently have 260 uh, substitutes. Um, however, not all of them are trained to do the distance learning and then the hybrid model. Uh, we are currently filling current and vacant positions with the um, SERP. Of course, we have a lot of positions to fill and we are working on that almost daily. Um, we have continued staffing meetings to attend and uh, we have a concern about how teachers will be tracked because we oversee the frontline system that teachers use to report absences and that is on behalf of the human resources division thank you mrs munchman uh questions from board members for mrs munchman I'll, I'll throw one out there uh, quickly, Mrs. Munsterman. Um, with respect to you know the hypothetical, if there's a return to hybrid this academic year, but also obviously it applies to next year. With respect to teachers and or staff that may have concerns with respect to their own underlying health conditions and exposures, will we be able to work through all of that? And how will, how that might how might that impact us 
particularly with respect to um, substitutes. I mean, we, we have struggled historically to have sufficient substitutes under normal circumstances. What other school districts have experienced in other counties um, is when they have gone back to hybrid, if they have gone back this academic year, they've seen very large swaths of teachers either call out or refuse to come in because of concerns of exposure to COVID. We anticipate the same um, issue. Like you said, subs are an issue for us. And um, with the hybrid, it would be a bigger issue. Um, for, we have a, um, a resident sub at every elementary school site that can um, be utilized as if there is an emergency or if they need to train a um, substitute teacher that comes in and is not familiar with the distance learning model. But that is a concern for HR. We continue to post and hire um, substitutes when we can. And um, as far as teachers who um, may not uh, be physically able to come back, we HR monitors all the doctor's notes and um, uh, ensures that teachers do um, have physicians to go to. If you know, let's say they all have to go distance learning, they have to go hybrid. Each individual need is accommodated for the teachers. All we require is doctor notes, but we do work with the teachers on an individual basis. Okay, thank you for that. I appreciate it. It's um, lots of uh, lots of questions that still need answers, obviously. And it's not just us, it's every district that's that's working through this. Uh, other questions for Mrs. Munsterman from board members? All right. Well, and one other point you brought up, Ms. Munsterman, can you confirm we, we, we are seeing a significant number of employees retire due to the program that was offered. What's that number again? Um, I think I checked with Mr. Jensen. I think it's 161. So that is 161? Employees. So that's 161 employees positions that will need to be filled by HR in addition to all of the work that we have to do here with respect to um, getting back online. So you have an, an additional burden laid on you to backfill all those positions um, as soon as possible, really, uh, starting next year. Um, we're doing that right now um, as executive cabinet evaluates the positions and uh, we take them through position control and we're trying to fill as many positions as we can. My goal is to have everybody in place by the time school comes back. Um, and then we do have the additional MOUs that we are negotiating um, pertaining to positions and school cleanliness and whatever may come up that requires an MOU. But we have a good working relationship with our unions and they're being proactive with HR. So it's a collaborative effort to get the MOUs done in a timely manner and getting the hiring done in a timely manner. Yeah, it's a lot. We've done it before. Three years ago, we did 158. So I have a wonderful division. You do. That you do. Thank you. And it's not, uh, and you're very experienced, so we appreciate that. Uh, any final questions for Ms. Munsterman before we'll, we'll conclude with Dr. Miranda and his last couple of slides? Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Munsterman. All right, Dr. Miranda, you're, you're up. You're the closer. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Board President. Thank you, Executive Cabinet, for that thorough report. Uh, and so let me summarize what we've said in just one short slide here. Uh, and so the county uh, continues to, uh, and CJZ continues to be in the widespread purple tier. Uh, in fact, we're above the county, and you see Bloomington is, is significantly above that, uh, the uh, 25 per 100,000. So even though the county has reached the case rate necessary for elementary schools to be open, uh, however, uh, when you look again, the impacted areas in our district, we need to consider that when you make, or the board, we'd ask the board to consider that when you make your decision. Uh, our consistently, our communities have uh, the highest rates. Uh, uh, last year, we ended up at 190, significantly high. There's still a high risk out there. Uh, the new variant that, that's uh, out there is, is a concern. Uh, so I also wanna add that uh, prior to our staff returning uh, or to work, 
uh, we uh, were impacted immediately by the, out, the outbreak and the surge. And so we had to quarantine a lot of our employees. So uh, we were really proactive in that and, and uh, contact tracing and our nurses did a phenomenal job. So uh, that took, it really impacted our employees, all the quarantine we had to do because of the high numbers. While we see promising trends and there's no doubt there are some trends out there uh, within our community, However, we need to be uh, cautious. Uh, so using the factors uh, in uh, what I've sh we shared in this presentation this evening, uh, we're making a formal recommendation uh, to remain in distance learning through the end of the 2021 school year. Again, uh, we want a safe return for our st all our students and our employees, and we, we have to keep that as a priority, that the safety of CGSD staff, students, and families remains our top priority. Next slide, please. So uh, th this is the uh, slide I was talking about earlier in terms of the, the timeline, reopening timeline to give you a, kind of a visual aid here. So I uh, just wanted to touch on some points there that uh, as you can see, the end of the year is coming quickly. And so uh, in, in the academic year is ending uh, June 4th. So uh, at the conclusion of the of spring break, uh, the four quarter uh, instruction uh, uh, begins. Uh, so teachers and students uh, have already developed their routines, as stated very clearly. Uh, uh, we've already built the the routines and the consistency. So to stop and then retrain them and and do the routines again would be very difficult. Uh, we know distance learning is not the best uh, option. We want our kids back. There's no doubt we miss them, uh, but we've already completed 75% of the school year. Uh, and so with that, next slide, please. So my recommendation, my strong recommendation is that uh, we continue to stay in distance learning and we stay that through the end of the 2021 school year. Uh, there is no doubt, and I'm extremely confident because we have uh, the mechanism, the strategy, the uh, uh, the drive to get to be ready for the school year, uh, this next school year, we 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 will be ready. Uh, there's no doubt, uh, and so uh, I wanted to reassure the board that. So uh, with that, uh, that uh, ends uh, our presentation this uh, tonight. And uh, I, if there are any questions, uh, uh, any final questions, I'd be more than happy to, to address those. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Miranda, for that. That was a, a very in-depth and thorough presentation. And thank you all, all for cabinet's participation um, in that. I wanted to put, if I may, just a little bit of uh, presidential privilege. I'll put a, put a pin in things. I do want to get back to board member Haro's earlier comment question uh, with respect to testing and obviously the concerns around testing, uh, she had asked if we could uh, ask for consensus amongst the board to direct the superintendent to you know, draft a letter uh, and use that uh, on behalf of the district as we lobby the state um, to make exceptions this year, obviously with respect to testing because the, the obvious, um, mm -hmm. I'll say inequity. And board member Harold, would you like to go ahead and make that ask? If they didn't, then we could have had more time to vote. Yes, sorry about that. I was muted. Um, yes, I'd like to see a consensus so that um, we can have that letter or give Dr. Miranda the authority when he meets with uh, Assembly Member Reyes. Whatever it is we need to, to do to see about uh, voicing our concerns regarding state testing this particular year. Okay. Um, is there consensus amongst the board? Is there anyone that would object to providing that direction to Dr. Miranda? You have my consensus. I'm in favor. Okay. I agree. I agree too. And I certainly am on board as well. So you, you have your uh, consensus and, and direction, Dr. Miranda, if you would please um, convey that message, not only to some member Reyes, but to um, Department of Ed and, and all of our um, advocates in, in Sacramento. Thank you, Board President Florida. Thank you. And thank you, Pat, for, for hitting home on that point. It's a really important one. 
All right, we'll jump back into the, the conclusion of the presentation. Uh, we do have a couple of more uh, speakers, Dr. Mann, if I'm not uh, mistaken, with respect to uh, the, and I'll share this with the board. Obviously, these are unique circumstances. Um, th there is no manual for this. You know, we are making a very important decision tonight, and over the series of months, we've been making very diff difficult and important decisions. I felt that it was important, particularly given tonight's presentation, that before we take any action and include it in the participation is uh, are the voices, if you will, of um, both of the employee associations or unions that are represented um, by ACE and CSEA to also give them an opportunity to um, provide some of their perspective briefly um, with uh, the question really of distance learning versus hybrid. Uh, and so we offer that opportunity to each uh, union president. They've accepted that opportunity. I believe tonight we have on the line with us both of our union presidents. Um, I would like to start with ACE as we typically do at our board meetings. And so if Ms. Parachi is available, uh, we'd like to give her a few minutes to share her perspective, questions, concerns, and thoughts representing our certificated member, our certificated employees. Thank you. Good evening, President Flores, esteemed board members, Superintendent Miranda, cabinet members, and a member of the audience. My name is Christina Parachi. I have the privilege to serve as the president of the Association of Colton Educators. I am here to speak in support of the CJUSD staff's proposal or recommendation to remain in distance learning to June 4th, 2021. The Association of Colton Educators is ready and willing to work with the district to return to in-person teaching when it is safe for our staff, students, and our community. In the last few months, the educators became the pawns in the political arena and the return to in-person teaching became very political. I know the community is hearing from the news outlets and social media that the big bad teachers union do not want, to, do not want students back in school. I want to make it clear that this is not the case in CJUSD. The Association of Colton Educators have been working with the district to create a plan and to bring our staff and students back to school when it is safe. Looking at the county COVID dashboard, sadly, our district is still into deep blue or uh, purple, even though some parts of the state are in red, orange, or yellow. The superintendent, together with the school board uh, members, worked hard to secure vaccines for our district again after we lost them. And we are thankful that, for that. However, the second vaccine will not be done before April 5th. Having said that, and listening to this long and very uh, thorough presentation that cabinet put together with their staff, here are a few things to think about before you vote. If you are voting to return on April 5th and do not accept the staff's recommendation, I suggest you think of a few items that were clearly stated in the presentation. Testing. You will be bringing our students back to in-person teaching during the testing period. Uh, and I heard you talking about sending a petition. Although our members have signed many petitions that were sent to the state asking the legislature to cancel testing this year. The transition from distance learning to hybrid will require time for the students to accom accommodate to in-person learning again. In some cases, TK, K, 7th grade, ninth grade, the uh, environment is totally new and our students have not been in school for 12 months. The curriculum pacing guide will have to be adjusted from five days a week synchronous teaching to a two days a week in person as a minimum day, one day a week virtual learning, and two days a week asynchronous schedule. We are in session for 17 more days before the spring break, and everything that was discussed in the presentation has to be finalized. The sample classes looked very nice and ready but that is a select few classes at three sites. The district staff will need to prepare 29 school sites to welcome students back on campus on April 5th, depending on which way we're bringing students. 
The staff will have to stop all planning for next year and possibly the summer school in order to accommodate the changes that will occur. Can this be done? Definitely. Will it be a lot of stress? Definitely. This will be chaotic for students. It will be chaotic for, for staff and all the changes for 10 weeks left in this school year. I hope you make the right decision. Thank you for your support and dedication and good luck with your decision. Thank you, Mrs. Paracci. We appreciate again your, your input and your partnership um, with, the, with, with the district. So uh, I'd also like this time to invite our president for CSEA, Mr. Pacheco, to share some, some comments, thoughts, and, and feedback with respect to uh, tonight's presentation. Mr. Pacheco? Board President Flores, can we pause to switch our sign language interpreters, please? Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Janelle, you're on. We're all set. All right, can you hear me? Great, thank you. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, uh, just a quick disclaimer. Uh, the, view, the views and opinions expressed in the statement are those of CSA Colton Chapter 244 and do not necessarily reflect the views and position of CSA at the regional area or state level. This is all Colton. So CSA wants nothing more than to be back in our physical classrooms and school sites and know firsthand there is no equal substitute to regular in-person learning. California schools are the heart of their communities. For many of our most vulnerable and underserved populations, they are lifelines. Uh, CSEA Colton Chapter 244, formal stance on students returning to in-person learning for the 2020-2021 school year is inadvisable and currently unsafe. Looking back at our past attempts starting in June 2020, we made a rash decision to bring back some of our classified employees which in July 2020, we were forced to scale back on our staffing due to increased COVID exposures. In October 2020, we made another attempt to increase classified employees hours and days at a district site. This attempt resulted in classified employees being sent back home at the beginning of December due to increased COVID exposures. Employees still at sites had minimal hours and scheduling alterations for the safety of those still present on sites. Fast forwarding to more recent months, we proceeded to ask a fraction of our classified employees to return to their site. To no one's surprise, exposures to COVID have continued at a concerning level. The continuation of COVID exposure does not even account for students, teachers, and admin who have yet to return to district sites in any capacity. San Bernardino County has some of the highest COVID rates in the state. It would be unwise and unproductive of CJUSD to attempt in-person learning at the risk of exposing students, staff, families, and the community at large. There are approximately three months of schooling left in the 2020-2021 school year, an insufficient amount of time for us to feasibly transition students from distance learning to in-person learning. In addition to this, my concern as president of CSEA Colton Chapter is the mental and emotional well-being of our classified employees. Having virtually no time to fully prepare classrooms, school sites, and district offices would yield unprecedented, unprecedented stress on our employees, both classified and certificated. For this and various other reasons, I firmly advise the board members to reopen schools at a later time. As a resident and parent in this district I work for, it is my desire for my kids to have a normal school year. However, risking people's safety and well-being isn't something I will vote in favor of before. And um, just a, another thing, you know, uh, after hearing board member comments throughout the presentations, um, I believe it was Ms. Dorn Ojeda who did bring up um, a lot of key points about, you know, classified has been on campus or at sites. Um, I believe since last year, I think maybe the schools or the whole district was shut down for a week and then we had nutritional services, IT, among other ones, um, at sites this whole time. We have increased our hours and then we got shut down, like I said earlier. Um, my, my thing right now is I hope you guys don't start with the in-person learning. I hope you hold off on that. And if you do, 
I would just like to remind you that classified, who is overlooked many times on a lot of things, um, we want to be safe too. So if you're going to keep teachers and students away, I would please ask the board to give the district direction to also, you know, keep our classified away on a minimal hours, minimal day basis. Because our people, once you look at all those reports of exposures in the district, I would bet a vast majority of them are just classified. So please keep our people safe too. Um, don't forget about us. And thank you for all that you do too. Thank you, Mr. Pacheco, for that. We, we appreciate your feedback and uh, and we certainly appreciate the hard work by our, our classified staff. So uh, as many of us know, um, it's not just what happens in the classroom, it's everything that goes on to support the classroom, everything from nutrition services and the meals that have been served throughout this time, um, and those classified staff that have been on campuses, maintaining things, keeping things clean, providing that maintenance. So it, there has been a great deal of sacrifice on behalf of our, on behalf of our employees. So we appreciate that. Thank you for, for um, your comments. Okay, well, we that concludes the staff's formal presentation. At this time, I'll, again, I'll open it up uh, for questions, comments, thoughts. Uh, we do have an agenda item, an action item that we'll get to, and that's um, where we can certainly deliberate and um, ultimately make a decision. But before we jump into the action item per se, I do want to open it up for any other questions or comments that staff may have, excuse me, board members may have for staff about the presentation. Hello, this is Sandoval. I have two. Um, one is, do we have any resource or support for our kids that are falling into depression, suicidal thoughts, um, any emotional support that we could give our kids, our parents? Because the distant learning, having the lack um of social interaction for some student it has, it has been hard for them do we have any support for them if i may address that question president Floyd. please mr day yes so we do have a mental health program in, in code joint unified school district that includes uh mou agreements with um but outside entities to provide the support for our students and staff, to be honest. And we also have an emotional support um, hotline. And so with those three different um, um, types of resources, we are definitely available for any students or staff who are in, in need. Thank you. And the second question was, for any students that are falling behind with the credits, for example, seniors, juniors, Dr. Peterson, you want to address that? Yeah, so we, um, um, one, of the, one of the things we talked about was that we currently have 11 um, credit recovery courses that are happening after school hours um, during the afternoons, evenings, and weekends um, that are providing support for our um, seniors have first priority. Uh, support for our seniors to complete um, credits or any any uh, classes that they've failed um, during first semester, um, as well as there's credit recovery as a class uh, attached to zero and seventh periods, I believe on some sites. And so um, there are opportunities uh, for that to occur um, that we've, we've uh, planned for. Yeah. Great, thank you, uh, Dr. Peterson, for that. Any other questions from board members? Dan, I have one. Please, board member Thorne, ahead. Um, I know the district sent out information on the vaccines to um, staff in general, and I'm just wondering if we could ask um, Dr. Miranda um, to make sure that every school site send that out and make sure classified people get it as well so that they're aware of the uh, information. Sometimes I know uh, in my past, the classified people didn't always get that because they didn't have as easy access to the computers as um, 
as maybe the certificated did. So um, I just wondered if they would be able to do that so they would take have the opportunity to take advantage of the vaccine as well if it's there's still places open. Yeah, uh, Brandon, do you want to address that? Because I know we talked about extensively in cabinet. Yes, um, absolutely. And great question. So yes, we will do so. Um, we'll send the information to each uh, site administrator to share with the classified staff as another additional layer of uh, communication. Very much. I have a question or something that I need to address. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, it doesn't have anything to do with the decision we make tonight, but it's, it is a very, very important uh, topic and that is graduations. Um, we have our three high schools that are, or five uh, high schools that are planning, uh, gra need to know what our plan for graduation are. And, uh, um, you know, we need to you know, let them know, is it gonna be virtual? Is it gonna be in person? Will there be self distancing? I talked to uh, Dr. Miranda briefly about this, and he informed me that that it's contingent on the uh, what the guidance from the Department of Health. But um, I think we will need to, to keep that date those dates in mind, and so that our seniors can plan accordingly and their families. Uh, uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Adegine, Vice President Adegine. Uh So. Uh, Right now, the, you know, we have the dates reserved uh, for a possible in-person. Uh, the, the timeline uh, is getting closer. Uh, we still haven't received in, in terms of, uh, so we have the dates for uh, June at the 66th Sixth Sixth Stadium, excuse me. Uh, and, and so we secured those spots. Uh, so uh, it, it is really contingent upon what the county uh, Department of Health puts out for in-person gatherings. Right now, they're still not allowed that this question came up in my meeting with uh, uh, the Department of Health and, and the other superintendents on uh, Tuesday, which was yesterday, about in-person gatherings. Those are still not allowed, uh, and I suspect that we should get something soon, <clears throat> excuse me, something soon. Uh, and so uh, I think pretty soon we'll be providing some, we'll get some guidance and we'll be able to uh, get that out to our community because uh, i know that uh, that's an important uh, decision uh, but at this point uh, they're still not allowed uh, so we'll see if that changes in the next couple of weeks but that's contingent again uh, depending on the department of health uh, and where they're at with um, in-person gatherings okay let's just hope that things get better so thank you thank you board member again any other questions from board members Board member, uh, board president Flores, I have, um, I think, some comments mostly, um, or qu or maybe questions. Um, I'd like to just make the comment, and and then there, I guess, staff can verify it or Dr. Miranda. Um, so right now, uh, <clears throat> surrounding districts, and I want to just make sure I have the information correct, that have already made the decision that we are presented with this evening have uh, San Bernardino City Unified and Rialto have already decided to stay in distance learning for the end of the 2021 school year. Is that correct? That, that's my, that's correct. That's my understanding. In fact, okay. uh, yeah. Uh, and, and sorry, not to uh, interrupt you. Uh, I, I uh, just talked to my good friend in Redlands. They still have not decided yet what to do. They're still making a decision about whether to stay in DL. Uh, and uh, anyways, so. As well as Fontana, they have not made a decision as well, correct? Uh, that's correct. Okay. But we have two districts surrounding us who have already made the decision. Um, oh, goodness, I had another question. <laughs> I apologize. I, I, I'm sorry for interrupting you. I apologize. No. <laughs> This is what happens when you get old, you forget, you get interrupted. <laughs> um, <laughs> let, me, let me, no, 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 it's not a problem. I'll let another board member go ahead and speak and then I'll come back to my question because I completely forgot, I'm sorry. Any other questions then for Dr. Miranda or staff? And thank you for that reiteration, board member Haro. I think there's sometimes a, a misconception uh, or misinformation about other districts when you hear about local districts um, that may have opened up. I, 
at this juncture, let's ask the reverse question, if I may, Dr. Miranda, um, what public school districts uh, have made the decision to come back um, to a hybrid model this academic year that are within the county? Obviously, we want to look at like districts, so, but um, are there districts in the area that have decided to come back that are like Colton Unified? The, 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 only, uh, the only district that, that I'm aware uh, is Ukaipa, and uh, they're bringing back uh, K-5, uh, effective April 6th. Okay. And so uh, they, that's, their, that's their plan as of, uh, in fact, I confirmed that uh, today, this afternoon. And that's the only one that you're aware of in the area that's even, even comparable in size to our our district yeah with, in terms of un, unified uh we do have uh, Etiwanda, uh the, which is uh, elementary school district they are planning on bringing uh, uh their uh, some of their elementary uh co small cohorts uh I believe k first and second back uh, uh in small it's really small cohorts uh it's effective march uh, i believe march 15th right before they go off spring break but they're, that's, uh, yes, yeah, so that's uh, Edwanda. And the reason why I know that is because my son goes to Edwanda Unified, but he's in the middle school and they're not bringing back middle school or, or high, well, they're not a high school district, they're a K-8 district, but they are uh, bringing uh, small cohorts uh, March, starting March 15th. Okay, thank you for that. And I just did a quick search. If I'm not mistaken, it looks like Kaiba Calamace is actually less than 10,000 students. So yeah, that's, that's that would make them less than half the size of our district. So we, again, size matters. I mean, the size and and, and area and um, and as you look at the data, it, it varies even from eastern part of the valley to where we're at and going out west. So um, okay, I appreciate that. Um, Board Member Haro, did you re yeah, remember your I, question? I think okay. In, in regard to what you just said, I think it's important also not only to notice the uh, to note the size of the district where they're coming back, but also the demographics. The demographics of the different are, are different, and their numbers are obviously different than ours. So I think those are things that we also have to look at. It's not just that district's opening; it's how you know what are their no what is the size of their district, and where are their numbers at in you know um in comparison say to colton if that's what we're going to look at why they're open i i think i mike i just want to make uh, my comment is does that and i think as board members we know this we're elected officials whatever decision we make tonight is not going to make everyone happy we have you know just like our public comments we have people who want us to stay in distance learning and we have those who want us to go back but the bottom line is the seven of us are here to make the best decision that we can given the information we're given and while i truly truly appreciate all the hard work that went into that presentation and it was a lengthy presentation so i know that a lot of work went into getting all the information to give us the best, to help us make the best decision we can make. But the bottom line is we are here to serve the communities that we serve in the Colton District. We are here to protect every student that walks through our doors. We are here to protect every classified worker that comes through our doors. And we are here to protect every teacher that comes through our doors and every member of management. It doesn't matter if you're in management or classified, you all deserve that same consideration. And that's what we're here to do. And like I said, whatever we decide to do, it will not make everyone happy. We're gonna have people who are mad. We have people who are mad because we're not starting sports. We're gonna have people mad because we're not opening schools. We're gonna have people mad because we're opening a school, whatever we do. But we have to do the right thing that we feel is the right thing to keep people safe. And I have faith 
I have worked with um, much like um, <clears throat> board member Ibarra. We both have worked with very, many different board members. And I have faith in this school board that I currently sit on that we will make the only decision, the best decision that we can that addresses the safety of everyone we serve. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Harlow. I appreciate that. Board President Flores, can we pause to switch our sign language interpreter, please? Certainly. Thank you. Phil, you're up. Great. Thank you, Thank you for that, Shane. Um, I think that's a that's a that's a good pause uh, because what I think what we'll do at this juncture is transition then to the action item that is on the agenda. And this would be the appropriate place where we as a board can yeah. deliberate. Uh, again, certainly have a conversation, uh, raise questions if need be, but, but share our thoughts and perspectives on uh, what we should do with respect to the recommendation that has been put before us by Dr. Moran. So we are now officially in item 4.1. Uh, the recommendation that is before the board is to remain in distance learning through June 4th of 2021, that of course is this current academic year. So um, as we do uh, for every action item, we typically begin with a motion and a second so that item can be open for discussion. So I will call for uh, a motion and a second for uh, this item. Dan, this is Frank. I'll make the motion to, uh, to approve to remain in distant learning through June 4th, 2021. And I, I'd like to add for the safety and health of all our students, all our staff, and our communities. Thank you for that, uh, Board Member Barr. We'll make that notation. Uh, Ms. Medina will do that in the actual uh, wording of the uh, of the uh, motion. So we have a motion by Board Member Barr. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Thank you. Second by Board Member Florian Ojeda. We have a motion in a second. So again, I will open it up for discussion amongst the board. Okay, I'll, I'll go first. Okay. This is this is Sadegui. This is Sadegui. Um, yes, um, I came into this meeting knowing uh, what a difficult decision we were up against. Um, I have uh, all the confidence that in our superintendent and our and his cabinet and his leadership team that they they are thorough and they explore every option and move uh, you know to make the best decision. Um, I also appreciate all the comments that we heard tonight. Um, I I especially um, want to thank the nurses for their input and their expertise because they work with our most vulnerable, stu vulnerable students uh, with health risks. And they, as a group, uh, brought to our attention some of the, you know, the, uh, the issues that we are up against. So, um, you know, I, I thank them for that. Um, you know, our students are, are, that are, um, have health issues, we have to think of them and it is our responsibility to keep them safe. We also have uh, you know, uh, teachers that have children with special needs uh, that we also need to consider. Um, also, many of our families uh, live with grandparents um, and we have this past year seen um, what, what, what has happened to our community. We live in this community. Every, I mean, we are part of this community. We have seen the loss of life. Students have lost their parents and grandparents. Teachers and staff members classified have lost their own parents to this pandemic. So we need to keep that in mind and we cannot grow numb to, to what's going on around us. So, thank you. Thank you, Board Member Adegui. Other other comments from board members? I have Dan. Please. <clears throat> I think tonight's one of the most important votes I've ever made. I you know, 
I spent over 40 years educating children, and that's been my passion in giving children an opportunity to to get the best education as possible. And this year has been really hard. I, I know teachers are working extremely hard and kids are working and, you know, we talk about learning loss. You know, they've learned a lot of other things outside the classroom because of this pandemic. But, you know, every year that I worked, whether it be a classified position or certificated or management, my primary consideration was always making sure that I did what I could possibly do to keep all my kids and my staff members and my community safe. We all live here together and we need to be family and we need to think about everyone when we make this decision. And I know, as Pat said, there's going to be a lot of people who won't agree with what we're doing. Um, and I'm sorry for that. It would be great if we could always make everyone happy, but, but I could not live with the fact that if I knew that a decision I made potentially caused someone to lose their life and I could have made a difference and I, I couldn't live with that. So, um, Safety and health is my a prior, my biggest priority that in my Did we lose connection? I believe we probably did. We, probably, did. we probably exceeded the time. That's why I'm thinking that's what it is. Um, okay. So hey, I, uh, I got kicked off here, so I'm really sorry. I, no, no, Ms. Lorena Hayda, I think everybody did. Yeah, we all did. Yeah. Oh, okay. It wasn't just. Right. <laughs> okay. I think, I think, I think Brandon's the only one with the video. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I, that that's all I need to say. Thank you. Let's give it a minute or two to allow people to get back on. And we need our superintendent. I, yes. I'm back here. I, can you guys see me? Yes. You're good. Oh. Okay. Now Thanks. I do. All right. My apologies. I got kicked out. I'm not sure what happened. Oh, we, I, but we all did. We all oh, did. Too. Okay. Like really loud, so much time. So I think that's what happened. So it's just oh, wow. kick you out. <laughs> oh. No problem. Oh, I was blaming it on Cisco, Shane. You should have just went with it. <laughs> that's good. The only thing more perfect it would have been right at the time that we were voting. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> It's all over Facebook. They see they don't want to scroll. This is the drum roll. Did YouTube continue uh, to go? Uh, do you, anybody know? Okay, great. No problem, Shane. Take your time. Uh, Joanne, uh, well, and, and of course, uh, Dan can, can make that call. You were cut off, so... I uh, I apologize for that. That's okay. I think um, I said what I what I meant to say. I believe that was enough. I think we caught. I'll be honest. I think we caught. I think we caught it all, Joanne. I think it was just right after we finished. Okay. That out. So. Okay. Just confirming, we have seven board members back on. Shane, my technology paranoia took over. <laughs> well, 
Shane is Shane is fixing it for our people who are listening. Is that correct? Okay, great. Thank you so much, Shane. Thank you for that, Shane. Our apologies to those that are listening in. We had some technical difficulties, but they have been resolved. So we are back online and um, we are in item 4.1, um, the recommendation from staff that the uh, district remain in distance learning through June 4, 2021. Uh, we are in board member comments, if you will, deliberation. Uh, board member Thorne Ojeda just finished her comments. Anything you'd like to add, board member Thorne Ojeda, or, or, or are you good? I'm good, thank you. Okay, thank you for that. And thank you for uh, your comments, Mr. Poignant. Um, other board members that would like to share their thoughts. Just to comment, uh, this is board member Fuentes. Please. Thank you. Thank you, board president. Just want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Miranda, the team, the executive cabinet, everyone who had a part in this presentation. You know, as many of my colleagues have said, you know, we were going to make a decision today. and. The decision that we make uh, is all about for our kids. When I came, when I became a board member, my thing was students first, and for me, students first means safety, health, mental, their families, staff, everyone that has to do with our district. And so, just uh, my comment is just to just to let you know that we are listening. And I want to thank you for the comments also that were uh, placed this evening and the comments that have been put out there throughout our, our board meetings. Like Ms. Harrell said, you know, we're not going to make everybody happy. And uh, I'm not here to make anybody happy. And I'm going to be honest with everybody. I'm here to do the right thing. I'm here to do the right thing and make the right decision. And uh, today, later in a couple minutes here, we are going to make our decision and we are going to make our vote on what was going to happen. And uh, I hate I, I hate to say it that way, but it's always about the priority, which is our kids, our kids, our families, our communities, and that's what we're that's why we sit on this board. This is why we were elected to be here, to be able to make these hard decisions. Trust me, you know it's it's been tough all day today, thinking about it, reading all the information that was brought forth. But I want to thank. Uh, once again, Dr. Miranda, for all his hard work, uh, for the teams that have been out there. I think that they said there was about 200 people also out there that have been working on this plan. And I uh, just want to express my, 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 my thank yous to each and every one of you for, for your hard work also, to all our classified staff, to everybody, uh, for all the commitment that you have. And I think uh, later, this, later in a couple minutes here, we are going to make that decision. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, board member Fuentes. Other comments from board members? I will, um, I'll add just a, I'll be brief. I'll add a few comments. Um, and first I'll begin by thanking staff. I, I know it's been a long night. Um, a lot of work went into the presentation and it was evident that the um, staff took the time to, to put before us a very well thought out, a comprehensive and detailed analysis of what would happen, what can happen, what will happen. And um, I'm glad we're taking the time as a board to, to take all of that information and to make a good decision. And board member Haro, you're absolutely right. There is no perfect answer here. Uh, there is no solution that's going to solve every problem. There's no answer that's going to make everybody happy. 
this is an imperfect situation to say the least. All of us, not just school, but our lives have been disrupted by this global pandemic and people um, have lost their lives. Uh, and we'll never get that back. Those who know folks that have been um, affected by this virus and certainly those who have lost loved ones. And I know uh, folks and have worked with folks who have lost loved ones to this virus. So the severity of it is not lost on any of us. It has disrupted our work lives, our professional lives, our, our personal lives, and the lives of our students. And so we will make the best decision possible given the very difficult options that are in front of us, but it is far from perfect. You know that we acknowledge that. Um, there is a personal impact to me, I think as, as many of you know, you know, I have students in the district. Uh, all of us, many of us do, but all of us have family and friends and, and um, grandchildren uh, in this district. If I'm being honest with you, my, my students have struggled in distance learning. Um, it has not been easy. And it breaks my heart that my kindergartner um, may not step foot in a classroom single day for very first year of school. You don't get kinder back. You get one shot at the first time. And it's possible that she may never uh, really have that experience. But keeping her safe, keeping our staff safe, keeping every student safe, because it's not just my students, my children, it's, it's the 20, 21, 22,000 students in this district. And they're all unique. Um, we cannot sit here and say that this is going to be good for every student. Uh, it's going to be bad for every student. Some have thrived in distance learning. Others have really struggled in distance learning and you have everything in between. So again, there isn't a one size fit all solution here. It's making the best decision with, with the information that we have in front of us and ultimately keeping our students safe, our staff safe, and getting it right. We have testing right around the corner. We have to prepare for summer school and credit recovery because we're gonna have a lot of students that are gonna need help. And we have to be prepared to open up next school year. And getting that right and taking the time to do that right is incredibly important to me. And so as difficult as it is, I believe that the right thing to do in this situation is to um, support staff's recommendation and take the time that's needed to do this right and ultimately keep everybody safe because one grandparent, one parent, one family member lost to this virus when it is preventable is one too many. So I, I appreciate the presentation and I appreciate the board's um, thoughtfulness, which we're addressing this. Thank you for that. Um, other thank other thoughts? And, board member, thank you for your comment. And you made a very good point as far as um, you know, I mentioned that we're responsible for all the employees of this district, but like you said, those employees have to go home to families. And um, I believe one of our board member comments was, or one of our comments was that she took care of her grandmother at home. These employees have to go home to those people. And the thought that, that they could bring home this virus to one of their family members in a way we are actually responsible for them also um i've lost several in the last couple of weeks i've lost several very 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 close people in my life and this didn't have to happen and i think it's an obligation as board members to watch out for the safety of the people we represent um in our areas and again and our our Colton family. So thank you for bringing that up. I, and I too just wanted, I didn't, I'd be remiss too. I did not say, or my earlier comment. Again, my thanks to all our staff for everything they did to uh, put the presentation together and also to thank all of the people who are on the various committees that are have been formed to get schools open, whether it be in April or whether it be uh, at the beginning of next school year. You know, there's a saying about it takes a village. Well, during a pandemic, we really found out just how much of a pen, how much of a village we need. So I, I just want to say thank you to everyone. Thank you, Board Member Harrell. 
Other comments from board members? Uh, I have a quick comment, Dan. Sure, please. Mr. Frank. Yes, uh, I'd like to just start off by thanking our staff and uh, all those that were involved with our presentation. It was very thorough and it gave us a really good picture of where we're at as a district and where we need to be to be prepared for uh, the upcoming uh, new school year. Also, I want to take uh, this opportunity really quick to thank all the parents, all the teachers, all the, the classified employees that we have out there and for their dedication and their concern over the process and preparing and key, uh, preparing for the new school year as well as keeping our students safe. And it was very evident that there were many, many individuals out there who uh, support uh, what we do as a district and the decisions that we make on the uh, for their students and for their children. So I just want to say thank you to all those people out there that definitely uh, have shown us support, not only during this time, but throughout all the years that we've been on the board, each and every one of us. So um, just want to just say thank you to all those individuals as well. Uh, Dr. Miranda, you always do an excellent job in, in uh, presenting and making sure that we have a clear picture uh, every time that we have to make a difficult decision. So uh, just want to say that as well. So thank you, Dan. Thank you, Board Member Barra, for that. Other, other uh, comments from board members? All right. Um, well, thank you for all that feedback. Uh, we do have a motion and a second on the floor. So I will then uh, return the item before us for action. And uh, I will show sure. What is it? Thank you. Thank you, Shane. That pause for dramatic effect. We'll, we'll go ahead and return to the item that is before us. We have a motion from Board Member Ibarra and a second by Board Member Joanne Thorne Ojeda to approve staff's, staff's recommendation to remain in distance learning through June 4th of 2021 uh, for the safety of our students, our staff, and our community. Um, we'll, that's a summary, Mr. Ibarra. We'll make sure that we phrase that appropriately, but uh, that will be included. Um, so at this time, I will ask Ms. Medina to go ahead and take a roll call vote. Mr. Ibarra? Yes. Mrs. Haro? Yes. Mr. Flores? Yes. Ms. Doreen Ojeda? Yes. Ms. Bernie Sandoval? Mrs. Sandoval? Yes. Mr. Fuentes? Yes. Ms. Arigui? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Medina. The item is approved. Yeah, All right. That is the only action item on tonight's agenda. Um, I just want to thank everybody for your participation tonight. Thank everyone that was listening, that provided comments, feedback, input. Um, again, we took the time that I think was needed to get this right and have a real in-depth conversation and come to a decision. So this time we are adjourned, Ms. Medina, until our next regular scheduled meeting, which is... Okay. We have a special board meeting next week. Uh, uh, sorry, about March 4th. Okay. All right. Well, 5.30. No rest for the weary, five then. Five o'clock. Five o'clock. Sorry. sorry. Five o'clock. Sorry about that. Joanne, you... you you speak, sorry. <laughs> Dr. Miranda. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again, everyone, for, for the hard work that helped putting tonight together. And again, for uh, everyone in the community. Dr. Miranda, I trust that you and your staff will share this information with the community every way possible to get the word out to parents, family, so that they are aware 
uh, of the decision you can make arrangements and uh, we, we'll, we'll get on it right away. Journey. yes yes absolutely we'll, we're we're on it right thank you all right that uh concludes tonight's meeting so we'll go ahead and adjourn so everybody please be safe take care and we'll see you next week thank you good, good night. night everyone good night everybody good night everyone Hi, everybody.